So it is how to retain empty knowledge before it walks out the door. Um, so that is the title, um, and uh, let's uh, look at that. So first, what is knowledge retention? So different uh, definitions, of course, capturing knowledge in the organization, so it can be used later. This is a really practical one, nor formal one, the collective, collective ability to store and retrieve knowledge and information. The bottom line is what you want. You want to capture the knowledge and experience that live in your organization and create your organizational memory. That is what it's all about. So uh, you want to sort of make sure that you track and trace everything uh, and then store that and make it available to people when they need it. So that is the, what knowledge retention is. And if you look at it, um, there are very different types of knowledge around and also uh, you can, if you will surf uh, the web, you will find a lot of different definitions. I like this one. It's an old one from Walsh and Unsen, and they did a research and they came up with like five categories of knowledge that you need to uh, uh, address. So the first one is individual. That's the knowledge that everybody brings to the table. So the second one is about structures. That is really about how you organize things in your company, how people relate to each other, how your social structures and company structures are. And that sort of defines uh, the context in which people can actually uh, gain knowledge, but also share knowledge. Uh, cultural is, of course, an important aspect, and that goes both for the company culture, but also local cultures, uh, which has an, uh, uh, a huge impact on, on, on the knowledge and the knowledge retention. So all that kind of information, so how you do things basically in your company is really defined by cultural. Then we have transformations, and that is everything in processes. So all the formal process you have in your company, all the flows that there are there, the funnels, uh, the, how information flows and how customers flow through your company, all those kind of uh, uh, knowledge uh, is, is connected to what they call transformations. And finally, you have external activity things where you as a company interact with other companies and those kind of information that can be customers, that can be partners, uh, that can be uh, whatever kind of organizations. And those kind of external activities also generate a lot of information and knowledge. So there are five categories of knowledge that we're talking about. And if you look at how knowledge is sort of divided, it's a very simple overview here. Uh, it's from Paul Scott, but it's not that complicated. So you have knowledge, which is on the bottom in the, the deep orange that everybody in your organization knows and shares. So that's the easy one. Then you have knowledge that is available and accessible for everybody, but it is like not top of mind, but people can access that. And then you have individual and collective knowledge that is not accessible for the, for the company. So there is knowledge, but uh, it's just sort of hidden in people's minds or maybe in a drawer or, or a server. And then you have other knowledge in the environment of the company. So that is a one step further away. And then you go into the big world. And of course, the key thing is to get as much uh, as the content, as the knowledge that you have, uh, in either in the, the well in the first two of these so knowledge shared by all members of the organization and if people can't memorize it if it's not always up to date they need to be able to access it and for that you need first need to store it and retrieve it so that is uh, where knowledge is and, and basically uh, the the darker the orange becomes the, the it more interesting the knowledge becomes because it becomes available immediately uh, when people are working so Knowledge retention uh, is driven uh, by a couple of things, but one of the big things is that people will actually leave your organization most of the time, sooner or later. Um, so in general, we see a trend that people are working shorter for one thing or organization than they used to. So if you look back like 50 years, people would have like a few employers during the lifetime, maybe even one. Uh, if I look at myself, so Easy Generator, although I'm there already for 12 years, it's like my eighth uh, employer. So, and you see that happening more and more, but that pace also picking up. I recently read a study that uh, uh, in their first 10 years, a graduate in the States, uh, on average, stays shorter than one year in a job. So that is really, 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 pretty fast. But whenever they leave, they take away knowledge and experience they build up. And of course, the longer they stay in your company, the more knowledge and experience there is there. 
to, to, lead, to lose. But that is not the only reason that people are just working shorter for your organization. It's also people retiring. And again, I am an example. So I'm, I just turned 60. So I'm from Generation X. And Generation X is uh, the generation that will leave the workforce between now and 10 years from now. So with that, they will take a huge part of the, the knowledge and experience that they have with them. So you need to capture that before it leaves your company. Then uh, on the bottom right, the great resignation, something we experienced during COVID. So uh, during COVID, a lot of people had to work from home. So they had literally more distance to their job. And we're looking at the job, is this uh, the, the thing that I want to do for the rest of my life? And a surprisingly large amount of people answered that question with no. And uh, we see uh, percentages of uh, people, of companies losing like 30, 40, 50, even 60% of their staff within a year. And that was really triggered by COVID, but it's something that's still going on. So there is a great mobility right now in, in the workforce, uh, and as, but it, it really got a boost with the whole COVID thing. And uh, well, uh, you hear more and more about looming recessions and things getting tougher from an economic perspective with the war in Ukraine going on, the inflation that comes out of that, uh, the rising costs. So um, budget cuts are probably inevitable for a lot of companies. And with budget cuts, it also means that you probably need to say farewell to, to employees. So then uh, you sort of push them out, but still you lose their experience and you lose their knowledge. So these are five reasons or four reasons why you could lose uh, employees and all reasons why it's really important to capture their knowledge uh, before it is too late. And uh, just to dive in all of them, just one by one. So as I said, people are working shorter for one organization and, uh, and it's happening all the time. And uh, so to retain knowledge, so the first thing probably you have to do is try to retain your employees. Uh, so, and, and it is something that a lot of organizations put a lot of effort in, in facilitating people uh, after COVID also, things are way more flexible, working from home. Uh, you even have uh, uh, people who are now sort of traveling the world and working from wherever they are at that moment. Um, so there are the digital nomads, they're called. So companies really try to facilitate that uh, with all their might, but still they will see people leaving. And uh, we have it sometimes at DC Generator. Sometimes it happens at DC Generator, of course, uh, as well. And um, sometimes you lose people that you really don't want to lose. I remember we, we lost one of our sales guys uh, not that long ago uh, because he had a dream. He worked for a couple of years really hard and was really successful in our company. And I said, okay, I want to take a sabbatical and uh, he wants to go to the Antarctic. And you can't compete with that as an organization. So people will be leaving your organizations. And I already mentioned a couple of other reasons there. So they're just working shorter for you. They're more mobile. So make sure that before they leave, you need to catch up, but also try as hard as you can, of course, to keep them in. That is the best knowledge retention that you can do. So a couple of numbers here. So employee turnover is averaging 60% in 2021 in the United States. Um, so the millennium uh, generation is now being dubbed a glass door generation. So, um, and really important because, well, I was already talking about the generation X leaving, but the other generation follow. So, you have to remember that by 2030, and that is just eight years from now, a bit less even, 75% of the workforce will be from the millennial generation. So their mindset and their uh, approach to work and how they view work will be dominating at that time. So you need to prepare for that. And eight years is not a long time. So, and 75% of millennials believe job hopping can be good for their careers. As I said, we see the 60% turnover employees. We, we see companies losing significant amounts of, of people. And that is triggered for a large thing by, by things like this. And those percent, percentages are a bit lower if you look at different uh, uh, age categories. So between 35 and, and 54 is 59%. Above 55 is 51%, but still then, People above 55, more than 50% of them believe that job hopping is good for their career. So it means you have to fight for, to keep your people in and you have to fight to keep your knowledge in. People retiring. So 
um, between now and uh, 15 years, 85% of the current workforce will retire. That is more than half. You have the baby boomers who are currently in the process of retiring or are already retired, which is like uh, 52%. Generation X that I mentioned between 1965 and 1980, uh, which is 33%. And a large part of that group will uh, uh, retire over the next years. And then you have the millennials and Generation Z uh, flowing up on that. Um, but it means that you will lose so much uh, of the knowledge that you have. And this is something that is just happening. What we, what you see happening is that people after they retire sometimes work like still part-time because retirement is not like a uh, really uh, as, as, as clear cut as it was uh, in the past, but still it will be very hard to retain that knowledge. So it's something you have to work on and you need to capture. So, as I mentioned, budget cuts. So recession is looming, uh, triggered by the war, but also before the war, there were some signs that things were slowing down significantly. We had, of course, uh, after the, the, the financial crisis, the banking crisis, a period of growth of like uh, eight, nine years uh, constantly. It differs a bit from country to country. And um, yeah, the economy, economy is slowing down, um, uh, triggered uh, even more by the war, the rise of the, the the, the prices of energy, especially triggered by the boycotts of, uh, of Russia and the other way that Russia is not delivering energy anymore or uh, really, really unclear situation. Uh, but it will lead inevitably to budget cuts and it will lead to losing people. And uh, it's also really important that um, if you have to make budget cuts and you have to save farewell to people, then very often, uh, the uh, the idea is that you want to sort of spare the most experienced people because they are the most worthwhile. But what, keep in mind that people like me are not there in a couple of years anymore. We are retired. So probably it's better to, to make sure that you capture that information from those people and maybe bet your money on the younger generation. So the great resignation also should be some extra details. So uh, a record number of people left their jobs since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's still going on, although the pandemic isn't, isn't hurting us as much as it was. So, so it's really different than a year ago. I think we were in a lockdown a year ago in the Netherlands. But what we see also for the last years is that we have really low unemployment rates and really high vacancy rates, which is a bit strange with a looming recession, but uh, it's still really hard to find people. There are way more people uh, uh, way more uh, openings for, for jobs than there are actually people that are looking for a job, which is a, quite a unique situation. Uh, it also sort of draws people out. It makes it really easy if they are not completely happy in your company or they think they can make an extra buck next door or they can make an extra step in the career next door, probably they uh, are inclined to go because they will be able to find a job very easy. Not sure how that will develop with uh, the the recession going on. So I heard here in the Netherlands, the first uh, uh, layoffs already announced. So for example, Philips, which is one of the main companies in the Netherlands, announced that they will uh, ha they have to let go like 4,000 people. Uh, so that is something we haven't heard for years. So this will probably become a bit more normal, but still it's really, really hard to find the right people for the right jobs and, and maintain the level of quality. And it's even harder to keep people in because there is like a pull factor going on from outside. I think that everybody at Easy Generator probably uh, will receive all kind of uh, uh, emails and uh, from uh, headhunters or other companies offers. So that is really, really normal nowadays. And that happens. And sometimes uh, an offer like that can be really attractive. So, but also remember that on average, replacing an employee will cost you 33% of their yearly salary. So let's say that an employee will cost you 100,000, then it's 33,000 K that you will lose, that you will actually lose uh, to, to sort of replace uh, that employee. So that's also something you need to take into account. And that also means that investing in keeping the people in and keeping the knowledge in that way is like uh, your number one priority. So that is the situation. So it's clear what knowledge retention is. Uh, it's clear why it's important, why people are leaving your company and why you need to make sure that you retain that. And if you look at this, then uh, this part here, the white part, that is basically where your sort of your knowledge is safe, but everything on top of that, it isn't. 
And basically what you need to do, you need to bring that down. And probably don't want to get all the information into people's heads, but you want to collect that. So, and especially from those two rings uh, directly outside your company. So company that is uh, from your company, but is not accessible to the company. That is one thing. So it's uh, something that uh, that is your first goal. And second, information around your company that lives there. You want to bring that in and, and make it uh, and, and, and keep it for safe keeping and, uh, and, and retrieval. So with that, the question is, how do you do that? And that is something that uh, we uh, at Easy Generator uh, learned a lot about. So um, one thing that I really uh, uh, like is, is this quote from Lewis Platt, and sort of uh, it's some, something that gives direction to us uh, at Easy Generator. And it, it is like, if HP knew what HP knows, we'd be three times more productive. And if you think about it, it's so powerful because what he says basically if somebody in your organization has a problem probably somebody else has the solution to the problem and if somebody in your organization has a question probably somebody else in your organization has the answer so the key thing is that that information that knowledge is stored inside the employees hats and with that you can't access it you can't find it you can't retrieve it so you would be way more productive if all that information would be available. And that is sort of the holy grail for an easy generator to allow people to capture their knowledge, to build up that body of knowledge and make it available to other people. So um, also taking one step back, uh, you see that there are different kinds of uh, types of content. Um, so you have like really specific information that is around for a long time. So uh, those, that, that kind of information usually has, is documented pretty well. So it would be interesting what, uh, what we did at this generator sort of went through this, this quadrant and look at where uh, are we strong, where are we weak? And uh, this one uh, came out a bit uh, more uh, better than the rest. Uh, a specific and perishable, that is really a, a risky one because uh, it is really specific to your organization and it only has a short shelf life. So it, it changes a lot. And uh, examples of that are, for example, uh, recently I spoke to uh, uh, one of our customers, uh, Canadian Mint, and basically they said, well, we're the only uh, company that, that is responsible for creating money uh, in Canada. So we're the only ones, people who work here are the only ones who actually know how it's being done. But those kind of organizations also change a lot uh, with all the things that are going on. So what you see is the information they have is really specific. It's not available outside the company at all. So it is what the, everything what, what is known about the company lives inside the company, but also whenever it changes, uh, you need to track that as well. So just tracking it is not, uh, uh, and storing it is not sufficient. You need to make sure that you also follow up and make sure that it keeps up to date. On the bottom left, we have generic and durable. So that is a sort of uh, information that is really uh, 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 available to, uh, to really common knowledge and uh, that has a last long shelf life and that makes it uh, really easy. It's also not specific to your organization, but to many. So it's also something you can get from the outside. And on the right side, you have the, the specific to many or so uh, generic and perishable. But that is what is not that interesting for you. So what you see is that um, the things that are specific for your company, so the top of this quadrant, are the most important one to focus on and that uh, the perishable ones are the ones that are toughest to capture. And the more generic it becomes, uh, the more important it, it becomes to, to, to uh, track. So how to solve this problem? And it is something that we sort of stumbled on by accident with CC Generator because we started in a different place. We started in the world of e-learning development. And if you look at the world of e-learning development, something that I have been working in for a long time, uh, you see a process that is uh, how that content is created. So on the screen, you see the LMD, which stands for Learning and Development Department. Uh, so that department is responsible for developing learning material, courses, training, things like that. And uh, their, their uh, educational specialists are called instructor designers. So those are people with a, a specific knowledge about e-learning, online learning. So usually they are the ones who have to create the content. The problem that you have 
though, is that uh, it is the supplementary expert, the employee, uh, who has the knowledge. The knowledge is in the business, and most courses are, of course, actually about that content that's specific to your organization. So you need to get that information from the business side. So the instruction designer needs to interview those SMEs, separate experts, those employees to get that information, put it in a course, go back to them to see if it's still correct. Uh, he has to solve conflicting input that he gets. And that process of going back and forth between the instruction designers and the supplementary experts, that is really time consuming. And with that, e-learning development also becomes really expensive. So um, it's safe to say that uh, the development of e-learning is really, really slow because of it, and it is really expensive. But that is not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that when uh, the course is ready, it's being published into a learning management system, an LMS. And that is the environment where the learner can look, up for, the, uh, look for the course and, and take it. And most instruction designers consider their job done. And that is also because they are not connected to the business. So they are not aware that the, the process they, they have described in their course are actually changing all the time. And sometimes a course is even outdated when it's being published. But for certain, if you don't keep it up to date, it will be outdated in a matter of weeks or maybe months. So the problem is the instruction designer is responsible for the creation of, uh, uh, for the maintenance of the learning, but uh, uh, the knowledge is on the business side. So there is a disconnect there, there. And because of that, the instruction designer can't keep the content up to date. So what we came up with at TC Generator is a very simple solution. So you just need to leave the knowledge where it is. So we came up with the idea of employee generated learning, where not the instruction designer, but a system expert is responsible for the creation of the content. And we started out with uh, 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 helping them to create uh, e-learning courses. So we created a very simple e-learning authoring tool that basically anyone can work with and they can put their knowledge in there in the form of a course or a training. And then it will be published and uh, go to the learner. The instruction designer is still there, but not uh, responsible for those courses. So they can initiate it, they can coach, they can guide, they can help design, they can co-author, they can do whatever they want, except for taking over the responsibility for the creation and maintenance, because that needs to be in the business. That's the only way to guarantee that the content that you create is actually alive. So that is what we did at DC Generator. And with that, people started creating courses. And then we also added other information. So I think that we call micro learning. So you can think about how to's, best practices, frequently asked questions, checklists, very simple one page document that can actually capture a piece of knowledge and that you also can use while you're working. So it's really more performance support content than learning content. And that is really interesting because what's happening now is that uh, a body of knowledge becomes to, to uh, appear from that. It's not only learning material, but also a lot of things, actionable content in the form of micro learning that people can use while they're working to help them solve problems or to tell them how to do certain things. So that is something that is happening over time uh, with Easy Generator. At the same time, we see a couple of trends appearing in the world of learning that are also affecting uh, generic uh, 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 content creation in the company. So the first trend that we see is that things are moving from formal to informal learning. So Jay Cross, the guy on the screen, is like my ultimate e-learning hero. He was the guy, by the way, who coined the word e-learning uh, in the 90s for the first time, but is also the one who moved away. So with his book, Informal Learning, he said, um, he sort of dug up an old theory, which is called the 70-20-10 principle, which is on the bottom right. And that says that 70% of what you know is uh, you learn by experimental learning, by doing. 20% is social learning, learning from others. And 10% is formal learning. And you have to understand that formal learning is everything you learn from kindergarten to university, all face-to-face -face training, all e-learning courses are part of formal learning. And that was what e-learning was focusing on with a top-down approach in instruction design and creating that. And uh, with his book on informal learning, he really opened up the minds of a lot of people in the learning that we need to do more. But even with social learning and experimental learning, which is both are called together informal learning, it's really hard to sort of write that down top-down. So it doesn't work 
to do that from a central point. You need to facilitate the people who are actually doing that learning, who are experimenting that learning, to capture that learning and share that with others. So also from here, from the trend from form to informer, there's a big push towards more employee generated learning. The second trend is that things are moving from knowledge to skills. So on the screen is Kathy Moore, and she has a, a theory she calls action mapping. And there's a lot more to it, but one of the key elements of action mapping is that she says that it is not about knowing things in, if you are learning in a corporate environment, it's about being able to do things. So it is about a change of behavior. So either you need to learn new behavior or you need to change existing behavior. But if that doesn't happen, you don't have learning that adds value to your business. And with that, it's not about knowing things, it's about being able to do things. So it's not about knowledge, it's about skills. And that is a, a second trend that we see more and more because you can find information pretty easily at, the, at your fingertips. So, so a lot of things you can just uh, Google or find somewhere else, but then you need to have the knowledge or sorry, you have to have the skills to be able to apply that knowledge and put it into, uh, into action. So with the action mapping process, uh, Kathy Moore told us that skills are the focus point and knowledge becomes less important. So also a knowledge heavy uh, 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 course is not uh, uh, really effective. And this is also something to take into account if we are capturing uh, uh, information and experience from the business. You have to go beyond the fact that it's just fact A or fact B there also needs to be information there. And that's why the micro learning part is so important to also start capturing that. How do you do that? How is the process? How do you apply that? You need to know that. And that also needs to be stored. Best practices, things like that, how to guides are extremely important. And then finally, we come to Con and Bob who came up with what they call the five moments of, um, uh, of need. So it's also uh, the applied synergies of their company who came up with it. And what they did is really simple, but pretty brilliant. So there are three phases in learning. And they found that if you are completely new to something or when you are, when there's a lot of extra information, uh, it is fine to go into a training approach. So you have to transfer a lot of information and that is the, the black line going up. That is the, the learning curve. So you have to transfer a lot of information in a really short time. Training, a formal learning approach with face-to-face -face training, classroom training, e-learning courses, that is a really good option there. But then you move to the transfer phase. So after you have been trained initially, then you become, uh, uh, you are on your way to becoming competent, but you see the black line going down, which is the forgetting curve. So basically by working on the job, by repeating things, by learning, doing things over and over again, you really become competent. So you need some time to competency there. And there's a transfer phase. And finally, when you are competent, you are in the sustained phase where you need to maintain your knowledge. But even in those two phases, you still have three moments of learning need. So when something changes, you need to be able uh, uh, to, to find out how to deal with that change. If you have a problem, you need to find out how you can solve that. And we have forgotten about something, you need to be able to retrieve to, to find it back. And you need to be able to apply those three things. So with these five moments of needs, um, what they say is really interesting because only the first two are learning content. And the other three, again, are performance support content, content that you can use while you're working. Because if I encounter a problem, I do not want to stop working, go to a classroom or a learning management system to take a training. No, I just want to Google it and find the answer. The challenge that you have with that Googling is that a lot of that information on how to solve that problem will be company specific, uh, like I showed you in the previous uh, quadrant. So, and with that, you need to store it first. So you need to create sort of like your own corporate Google in order for people to find that information. And that again is that knowledge base uh, that you can build up as knowledge retention. And then the final trend is that things are moving from top down to bottom up. And that is really the, the, the story of Easy Generator. We're actually writing a book on this as we speak. So if you look at the society, you see so many things moving in this direction. I just put in one example from uh, the, the television network, but you could also do that for the world of traveling or, or, or uh, 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 hotels or uh, music or whatever. You see the similar uh, thing happening 
all over the place. So, but if we focus on the world of television, then in the old days, you had what I call the broadcaster. So the broadcasting organization, the television network. So in America, Fox, CBS, NBC, Discovery Channel. So every country has their own, but the organizations that, that program the TV for you. And that program, they determine what you have to watch and when you have to watch it. So you can't change the TV. So the news is at eight, the soap is at 8.20, and uh, there's a movie at uh, nine. And if you want something else, bad luck, you can have a choice to maybe switch channels, and maybe there's something better there, uh, or you can switch it off. But that's the choice that you have. So, and then we, of course, got into the era of the, what I call the streamer. So the Netflix-like organization. So before that, by the way, we first got, of course, the video stores uh, with uh, the blockbuster chains and things like that. We got TiVo, which was a programmable video recorder that could actually pre-record a whole series for you. So you could watch it whenever you wanted. And the key thing of those things is it gives more power to the viewer when and what they want to watch. And that is also what Netflix and all the other streaming organizations like uh, HBO Max and Disney Plus is all about. They have pretty much the same content as those television uh, networks. So they have series, they have movies and things like that. The difference is it's not pushed to you and it's not pre-programmed. It's just there waiting for you to go in into your Netflix or Disney Plus and find it and, 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 and watch it whenever you want and uh, also what you want and even on which device you want. So with that, you see that things are moving more bottom up because it's the viewer who's now uh, in charge of uh, determining what he wants to view and when he wants to view it. And then you go one step further and then you come into the, uh, the category of the creators. So then we talk about the YouTubes of this world uh, and the TikToks of this world. So they allow people to create content. So basically what you see happening is that the viewer become the creator of the content. So somebody can create his own YouTube videos and other people can watch that. But that same person can also be the viewer of other videos. So both with YouTube and TikTok, we now have channels where people can create their own content. So that's even more democratized than uh, with streaming because then you still have to consume information from somebody else. You're not able to create that content yourself. So we go from broadcasters to streamers to creators. Things are moving from top down to bottom up. And as I said, you can uh, apply that to many, many uh, parts of our, uh, uh, of our economy and our uh, society. And one of them is learning. So if I create the same image for learning, you will get a view like this. You have the broadcasters and in the world of learning, those are the learning management systems. So organizations, uh, solutions like Cornerstone, Docebo, Subsuccess Factors, they are learning management systems where the L&D department can actually put in courses and push that course towards the learner. So it is mandatory training, they have to do that, it will be tracked and traced, it's all top down. It's very similar to how the broadcasting organization works. So if I am new at an organization, I log into ALMS, I just see eight courses that I have to take and when I pass those eight courses, I'm onboarded. So it is really top down like with the TV. So I, con I consider uh, the big LMSs in, the, in our world uh, being the broadcasters of our world. But then we also move to the streamers. So learning experience platforms are really like uh, tools like Netflix and, uh, and, and HBO Max. So they have the same content as the LMSs. Sometimes in a, sm a sm smaller form, but in principle, the content is very much the same. The thing is, the content is not pushed to the learner. The content is there waiting for the learner. Whenever they have a learning need, they can go into that system and find it. So the difference between uh, uh, an, uh, an LXP and learning experience platform and a Netflix-like solution is really small. The content is different, but the approach is exactly the same. So as we saw with the broadcasting organization, you have broadcasters and streamers, and you also have the creators in, uh, in our world of learning. And in fact, the same two tools, YouTube and TikTok are the, the largest educational platforms at the moment. So you, uh, I, I, for example, when I moved into the house that I'm now living in a few years ago, I wanted to, buy, uh, uh, to build a greenhouse from wood and glass with my own design. And I didn't know anything about that. So. YouTube taught me how to do that. And there's now already three years of beautiful greenhouse in my garden. Uh, TikTok is no different. TikTok is investing millions, and some people say even billions, in educational solutions. So a lot of learning content is on YouTube and TikTok. So they are becoming 
the more significant uh, learning uh, channels. And the thing is, the same happens as where the viewer becomes a creator. In this case, the learner becomes the teacher because I can learn from a YouTube video, but I can also create a YouTube video and share my knowledge and my information. And Easy Generator is like that, but then for a corporate environment. So it allows people to capture information, which can be a course, which can be a micro learning. Uh, by the end of the year, we even have video uh, uh, options that you can record video, that you can uh, 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 record yourself or screen and explain something there. So that trend is really much uh, uh, empowering the people to create things themselves, making from a, a viewer uh, a, a creator and making from a learner a teacher. Uh, that is what's happening and that is a trend from top down to bottom up. And you can actually bring all those trends together in what we call the learning diagram. And that learning diagram gives you sort of the overview of the whole world of learning. So on the top right, you have skills improvement, then you have formal learning on the top left. So top down formal learning is a description of the, the L&D driven uh, learning with formal courses to an LMS. Then you have knowledge transfer, uh, which is much more bottom up because people are sharing their knowledge very often in the form of a course or a training. So, for example, a lot of the content created in Easy Generator is like that. And you have performance support, also bottom up. So people are then sharing experience on how to do things, how to solve problems and how to, to uh, actually apply certain things. But that is also uh, information which is not meant for learning, but it's meant while you're working. So it's much more like support information. And those four categories are uh, basically describing the world of learning. And from an easy generator point of view, on the top of that diagram, you have like the instructor designers who are pretty much in charge, uh, creating content and pushing it down. And on the bottom side of things, you have the supplement experts, uh, where easy generator really focuses on uh, enabling them to capture their, their knowledge either in form of a learning or a performance support content. So this is where easy generator has a sweet spot, is the, the triangle. So the more you go on top, it's still also being used, by the way, quite a lot of, by instruction designers, but the real sweet spot of Easy Generator is facilitating people in the business, subject experts, to capture their knowledge in the form of a training or uh, a support material. And what we also see, there's a trend going from formal learning to knowledge transfer. It's a move that Easy Generator made itself, and now we're going more and more into performance support. So what we see is that tools are more and more facilitating the creation and, and, and the publication of content that is meant not to learn in, in a formal way, but to learn while you're working, so the performance. And with that, you get the impact of uh, uh, knowledge retention. So where Easy Generator, for example, started out to improve content creation, do it faster, uh, uh, to, to solve the problem that we have there with maintenance, also to create like a, a larger, uh, a, a group of people that can create content. That is where Easy Generator started. So it's really improved content creation. But what we found is that with that, we are creating that corporate memory because all that information is stored into your corporate brain. And uh, so I see that my text shifted around a bit, but uh, here are the five groups of that, uh, 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 five uh, types of, of, of uh, 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 content that you can create. But what you are doing, in fact, the moment that employees started writing down their knowledge in the form of a training or another resource, you are starting to build up that corporate memory. And with that, you get a knowledge base that you can use that people can work with while they're working because that corporate memory will actually contain solutions for problems and, uh, and tells people how to apply certain things. So while you're working, you can dive into that corporate memory pull out that information and actually be more productive. So, and with that, you get what you was Platt said, uh, if HP knew what HP knows, you would be three times more productive. You actually start to realizing that dream. So the, the Swiss Easy Generator, by allowing people to create content in a very easy way, you build up that corporate knowledge, and then uh, you can actually improve your performance. So, um, that is it uh, from my side. If you have any questions, I'm uh, not sure if you have any questions, uh, type them in the chat, maybe you already did. So Molly is hopefully tracking that. Um, if you want to hear more about m generative Learning, we have uh, an ebook on that. Uh, Molly will share the link with you in the chat. And then uh, we're ready to take 
questions. Yeah, perfect. So we had uh, yeah two questions come up um, throughout your uh, presentation, Casper. So um, the first one is from Carla, who asked, uh, how would you describe the value of people working shorter periods of time for one organization? Wouldn't that be considered an advantage for that person, having a broad view of how different organizations work and being able to quickly adapt towards change? Yeah, that is true. So something that uh, that indeed um, people are getting more used to switching jobs uh, uh, and, and, and working themselves in a really, really fast pace. But then again, there, if you just see how much company specific information there is around in your organization, it's really huge. And if that isn't available for them to, to actually either find or be taught on, uh, it will be really hard for them to be onboarded in a good way. Then they have to do everything by, by uh, just trying uh, and failing and finding out how it works or maybe uh, uh, social learning. So it is really a big boost if you actually have that captured. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so another question. And before I ask this one again, uh, if you have any questions too, feel free to put them in the Q&A section. Um, and we'll be sure to answer as many as possible. Um, but yes, another one for you, Casper. So if employee-generated learning empowers employees uh, to create their own content, um, should instructional designers be worried about losing their jobs? <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I was looking at the, at the chat, so I sort of missed it. <laughs> no worries, yeah, I, can, I can ask it again. Um, yeah. So if, if employee-generated learning empowers employees to create their own content, uh, should instructional designers be worried about losing their jobs? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so yeah, it is a change. Um, and for example, uh, companies like uh, uh, Danone, who are work with generator, they are uh, calculating that probably 95% of all learning in the organization will be bottom-up created by employees and only 5% will be created top-down. And uh, that means there's way less content to create for instruction designers. And with that, uh, there is less need for instruction designers. At the same time, uh, there are all new roles opening up. So the whole process of guiding super experts in creating those courses. Um, we also see uh, an application of employee generated learning where people uh, from the LD department are taking charge. So instead of interviewing people, they still ask, they just ask people to create content. So, but they're pretty much in charge of that process. So it takes different shapes and forms. So it will definitely be a change. Uh, a change in the kind of work they do. If it will actually lead to less instruction designers, I think that's a bit soon to tell. So I assume that the, a lot of new work will arise. And what I see happening most of the time, even when we automate things and come up with new things, it tends we need more people and not less. So I think that we still need instruction designers, both for creation of courses and to guide and coach SMEs. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so maybe another question um, related to this one that we just got. So can an instructional designer become a curator? Oh, sorry, I was again looking at the chat. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you probably saw this one, but uh, can an instructional designer become a curator then in this case? Yeah, for a large part, but that is a trend that is also really uh, important uh, because uh, I, I didn't really mention it here. So it's a good addition, but curation. So instead of creating content, making sure that people have access to uh, uh, existing content is a really big part of that, that body of knowledge. So for example, if you would ask me uh, to write a, 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 a course or a book on e-learning, I can probably write a lot of pages full, but it will be a lot of information. And you could also ask me what are like the 10 most important books and just give me a brief explanation why those books are important, what I can get out of it. So then you become sort of like a sort of a, a personal third engine that filters out the information and that is really, really important. And that by itself is, is really used part of the whole uh, uh, knowledge retention. So uh, with this generator, we are uh, expanding our micro learning capabilities and uh, then in these also curation, so not the, the, the creating of, co of content, but the capturing of existing content and framing that in a certain way. And uh, that is a really big part of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and another one, you mentioned microlearning, and this one kind of uh, mentions microlearning, but do you think that uh, with the changing employment scenarios, uh, new learning te technology should be introduced? Do we think, uh, or do we need to rethink microlearning to cope with the changing uh, learning needs? Yeah, um, good question. So the, the, the answer, in fact, is that we don't know yet. It also depends on how you define microlearning. 
So some people just define microlearning as smaller courses, but still like formal learning. In my mind, microlearning is something that you can use while you're working with that. The whole uh, dynamics of learning changes because that's so different than learning in a classroom. So I think the shift from formal to informal learning from uh, uh, basically classroom learning to workplace learning that is happening and with that everything changes so also indeed all the, the the audience how people learn what they want to learn when they want to learn but indeed also the tools and what you now see happening is that um, I think that the next thing in learning will not be like the evolution of a new tool we now have LMSs we have LXPs uh, we have knowledge bases so for the learner, the issue becomes, where can I find that information? And what you now see is that all those tools are sort of integrating with existing tools. So if you are working in Salesforce, you can actually look through Salesforce through all those databases and get that information. Or if you are in uh, uh, Teams or Slack, you can actually search directly through Teams and Slack for that information and get it there. So you will sort of come oblivion to where the content lives, but you uh, we are going to sort of use more and more existing channels to uh, uh, to benefit from that. Yeah, nice. And around that topic too, because a few people were asking for some more information, we have an ebook um, about microlearning at Easy Generator, which I put the um, link to in the chat as well. Um, so, um, yeah, feel free to download that as well. Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah. Someone asked, uh, Casper, I'm curious to hear how you are using Easy Generator. Um, maybe this is more around, um, yeah, how others are using Easy Generator, but any recent use cases you would like to share with us? Um, maybe we can discuss that, Casper, but also, yeah, in our later sessions, we'll go over that as well. But maybe you want to give a brief introduction for how most people are using Easy Generator. Yeah, that, that's maybe a webinar by itself. Um, yeah. <laughs> different so we see an application for example at electrolux we see people there trainers that apply the flipped classroom model so they capture a lot of the knowledge part of the of, of, uh, of their training in the course and ask people to take that up front and then uh, uh, during the classroom session which is now shorter they work on applying that by uh, doing role plays and stuff like that so uh, moving from face-to-face -face learning to a blended form is what we see a lot uh, as I said, there are organizations uh, implementing it really top down. So they use Easy Generator uh, and the subject experts as a replacement for creating the content by themselves, but they're still pretty much in charge of the process. Other organizations look at uh, a tool like Easy Generator much more like a way to share knowledge. So they allow anyone to create any content they want to create or share and, and leave that completely open. So there is a big mix of user stories there. And uh, we will, by the way, in, uh, uh, in the session with Young Case, uh, also uh, go into a bit more detail with a couple of examples there later today. Yeah, definitely. And even in the next one that we have coming up with uh, Herty Young, he'll be speaking about his personal experience with uh, Easy Generator as well. So <laughs> well-timed, I think. Um, and yeah, maybe just one final question, Casper, um, especially since this uh, event itself is focused a little bit on the future and preparing yourself for the future. Um, so Federico asks, is there a plan for the metaverse, uh, maybe when it comes to this <laughs> generator? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, uh, if, if, if Meta uh, has a plan for the metaverse yet. Uh, I'm not sure. So uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at that. I think it could be really, really interesting. Uh, but we had things like uh, uh, Second Life, where you could actually create a second sort of uh, uh, well, a virtual world where you can walk through and learn and, and work and play. And the idea of, of the whole metaverse is sort of the same. So I'm not sure what it will uh, will mean for learning. So I'm really following that, but I haven't, uh, yeah, I don't really understand yet what they are going to do. So it will be a big surprise, but uh, it will, if it is successful, it will influence uh, learning uh, definitely. So something that I, I really look forward to. Uh, I'm Kasper Spiro. I'm the co-founder of Easy Generator. Uh, if you want to see the session we did on knowledge retention, you can see the recording, which we'll make available later on. Uh, but now we have the second session of the day with uh, Geert de Jong, uh, who is a uh, learning and development consultant, but also an FPAC implementation strategist. So Geert, uh, maybe you can uh, do a better introduction yourself. Thank you, Casper, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this session. I'm very happy to be on the panel with these other speakers. 
Um, like you said, um, I'm an L&D uh, consultant by profession. I have been for around 10 years uh, working in different capacities at different organizations, both commercial and private. Um, I've done my fair share of pioneering as well, uh, mainly uh, in the field of online learning and corporate learning. And around um, six years ago, um, when I made the transition to the L&D department of a hospital, where I worked first as an associate, then as a learning and development consultant. Uh, we also tried to um, improve on our uh, system that we had back then, which was mainly instructional design. And around uh, three or four years ago, uh, we also implemented uh, the employee generated strategy. So we had our own employees create courses, which was a big change in our organization. And as of a few months, um, I'm quite uniquely positioned because I'm part of Easy Generator. I'm part of the success team at Easy Generator, which means we uh, help customers uh, with our rollout of Easy Generator, doing success planning together, how to measure success. And I'm mainly there for the larger customers, so the enterprise um, organizations that use Easy Generator and um, organizational change at big companies and big businesses usually take some time um, so that's where my experience i think comes in handy and also just uh, being able um, to look at it from both sides in my current role i get to speak to a lot of l d professionals at different companies but i also experienced uh, doing a rollout myself so to co coalesce this information and feed it back to the customers, either through customer success or through webinars like this is a real um, interesting privilege uh, for me to do at this moment. Yeah, thanks for that introduction and uh, happy to have you both on the panel and at this generator, I have to say. So Geert did a, a tremendous job at UMCG where it was using Easy Generator for indeed MP generated learning. It was really, really good results. So we're really happy that we would be that we were able to get your experience into Easy Generator. Um, so I have uh, uh, two more questions before you're allowed to start your presentation. So the first thing, so what is the biggest difference uh, between working for an organization like UMCG, which is large a hospital, like 50,000 people, and Easy Generator, which is a scale-up organization uh, growing really fast. So what is the biggest difference for you? Um, I think uh, there's many more layers in a large organization, both uh, layers in terms of decision making, whereas a startup, uh, it's all very uh, non-hierarchical. So if you have a good idea, it gets through very quickly without having to go through a lot of layers. Um, but also just um, um, because you're a small startup, um, you innovate quickly. Uh, good ideas are very welcome, uh, always at Easy Generator. And I think um, in a large organization, you are mainly uh, specialized. So you become very specialized in a certain area, uh, talking to certain departments on larger projects. Whereas at Easy Generator, the main difference for me is that I get to speak now to many different con companies from all over the world, um, talk about their type of learning that goes on in the organization. And of course, also to advise them now on Easy Generator. So that last part is kind of the same. I also did a lot with Easy Generator at my previous organization, so that will remain the same. Okay, thanks. And uh, well, the other move that you made, not only from UMCG to Easy Generator, but also from uh, Groningen, which is the north of our country, to Dubai, where our uh, headquarter is. So what is the biggest, uh, uh, how do you like Dubai? Um, I like it a lot, the city. Um, the weather is now great at this uh, moment in time. And the ambition level, um, Easy Generator is really in a business district where a lot of startups, uh, companies who look to grow uh, are based. So there's a real atmosphere and excitement of uh, growing and the ambition uh, at Easy Generator is also very high. So I think I am uh, found the right place here in Dubai. And uh, to compare it to the north of the Netherlands, uh, Groningen, uh, that's quite hard. You really have to be there, be here, I think, to experience it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a huge difference. Okay, so the floor is yours. Go ahead, Geert. Thank you, Casper. By the way, the, the talk is about aligning learning value with business value. So it's really uh, suitable based on what we just heard from you. Just a quick check. Am I on full screen now? Yes, you are. Excellent. Good to go. Okay, I'll take over. Thank you. Uh, so my um, presentation is on uh, learning value and business value. 
uh, primarily as an L&D professional, um, you are thinking about how to uh, advance certain uh, learning projects that will help your business. Um, but I'm also talking now about a new way to align learning value with business value, to integrate learning into your business. And that is uh, the main concept that we also have here at East Generator, um, which is the employee generated model where authors create their own courses. So that will be uh, the primary way of aligning learning value with business value. And I, it is a case study. So I will draw on my own experiences, talk about how we managed to incorporate this concept into uh, the learning offerings uh, that were uh, at our company. Um, but I'll also um, just speak a little bit uh, about the conclusions you can draw from it. So what areas does the EGL model really benefit? Um, so just a quick overview of the talk I'm about to give. First of all, I'll talk about what it means to view e-learning as a strategic business asset. Um, I'll quickly move from the theoretical level uh, down to the practical level, showing you some examples of actually integrating e-learning into the business processes to offer maximum support to those processes. Um, I'll uh, talk about uh, the new role for the business experts uh, in the content creation process and the areas in the business this has the most effect, this change. And I'll also talk a bit um, about what we call the e-learning democracy, where um, basically uh, good ideas for e-learning are very welcome. Um, L&D has less of a filtering function about what trainings get made by whom, but also just to highlight that this doesn't mean anarchy, this type of model. And finally, we'll have some room for questions as well. Um, it is a case study. It is drawn from my own experience at the UMC Groningen, a large hospital. Uh, we have around 9,000 medical staff, four or 5,000 support staff uh, spread out over multiple centers in the north of the Netherlands. Um, the main switch that we made there in terms of online learning was uh, at the end of 2019, when we switched from the instructional design model, which is common still in a lot of um, organizations, especially the medical sector, to the employee generated model. So where employees offer their own courses. Well, since um, we adopted this approach, uh, we had 500 uh, of our staff, both medical and support staff, who set about creating courses for their peers. This um, led to the creation of 1,100 courses. Uh, combined, those courses um, had over 50,000 views by our, our employees. And um, in my final year, I kind of set this off against all the vendor uh, purchased e-learnings that were also available to our staff. And you could really uh, tell the popularity um, of the e-learnings created by our own staff. They were much higher in terms of use than um, the e-learnings that were purchased from vendors. Um, from a business point of view, uh, numbers are important. They don't tell the whole story, but they are important, especially when you have to justify to your management what you're doing. So um, we justified it by looking at the number of um, ILTs, the instructor-led trainings that were reduced thanks to this new model. So when a new employee comes into the hospital, they have to receive a lot of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder training at, uh, to learn how to use uh, medical software, different programs in use in the hospital. And a lot of this um, used to be face-to-face -face or instructor-led uh, webinars. And um, a lot of them were turned into e-learning. So that is still one of the primary uses of the e-learning in the UMCG Groningen, which is turning um, instructor-led trainings into e-learnings. And by doing so, uh, we um, saved about 3,500 hours of instructor-led training. So if you do a quick sum, what that means, uh, you have to have an instructor, you have to have a classroom, sometimes catering, people have to show up, they have to drive there, they can't do it in their own time. So just looking at the numbers, this is a big save. And I won't talk too much about the numbers, I'll get into the case study quick. Uh, first uh, though, um, a little definition. Because what does it actually mean uh, to put e-learning and learning in the service of the company? Um, well, for this, um, there's different ways of looking at it. Um, I took a, a definition actually from Gary Luffman, who was famous for his organizational maturity model, 
where he looked at the maturity of all the applications in an organization being aligned with the business. So ideally you'd have every application in the business also contributing to your corporate goals. So um, turning that um, into um, um, a, a learning definition, I took his definition of maturity and um, changed it a little bit around. So uh, what you could see as um, e-learning being a strategic business asset would be the production and the application of appropriate, appropriate online trainings at the right time and place with the purpose of helping to achieve corporate goals and objectives. So starting out with the definition, I would say that is the definition of strategic online learning, applying it at the right moments in time with the aim of achieving your business objective. Um, also, um, strategic uh, corporate learning, what does that mean? Uh, that means not just uh, focusing on one area of, of your business or one type of process, but really putting learning technologies in the service of both primary and secondary business processes. So primary business processes is whatever you're selling, whatever you're making. Secondary business processes is everything that supports that. So HR processes, uh, IT applications, uh, in order to make it run smoothly and to contribute to uh, the primary business processes. So ideally, um, your learning and your learning technology would service both these areas. And oftentimes, um, an L&D department focuses on the secondary, the secondary processes, the more HR side, compliance side, without actually looking at how can we facilitate and integrate our learning offerings into the primary business processes. So in the in case of the hospital, that was caregiving to patients. And what does it also involve? It involves looking at each business unit as a rich star of possible larger scale training opportunities. Um, at every business unit, um, there are training opportunities. There is knowledge transfer going on, different practices um, that's when um, you uh, look at it from a larger scale, um, you can actually see uh, training potential there. So those um, um, uh, tricks and, and tips of, the, of uh, 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 those tricks that, that uh, everyone has, the intuitive skills, you can kind of bring that out at each business unit. So that was, is what we call the democratic model, where we don't just focus on a few business uh, model uh, units, but basically all kinds of business units uh, have the opportunity to contribute uh, to the larger business goal. Because if you have a complex organization, each of these different units ideally contributes to your business goals. So um, there's also the potential there to look at uh, what instruction, what knowledge transfer is there in order to advance these business goals and then see um, if they can turn that into a training. Okay, uh, to get down to business, um, uh, the case studies uh, are all drawn from the hospital. Um, a large hospital with both, both a research section, uh, but mainly primary care, uh, all sorts of care uh, take place at the hospital. And uh, one uh, primary uh, aspect um, of the online learning offerings at our hospital is knowledge transfer at the workplace. And what that means is um, whenever a doctor comes into the hospital or a nurse, they have lots of theoretical backgrounds. But um, what really uh, makes a good doctor is the kind of uh, experience that allows them to immediately recognize uh, a certain situation, uh, a certain condition with a patient to describe the right treatment. And that is experiential knowledge that only um, ta that takes time, um, that requires seeing a lot of examples. And this uh, kind of intuitive knowledge um, that was also um, brought out in the way of e-learnings. So many of our departments uh, in the hospital set out creating e-learnings um, on different cases, on rare cases that doctors might not uh, immediately uh, see when they join the hospital. And this is all done in order to improve and speed up to accelerate uh, that process of learning uh, through experience. So what the doctors did, they created a lot of uh, e-learnings for their peers um, with um, instructional material. A lot of it was visual, uh, so different conditions. 
And um, they captured this knowledge that they had uh, of all these different cases that they uh, oftentimes uh, discussed once a week in a face-to-face -face setting. They turned that into an e-learning. And so we had a real rich store of uh, many of these e-learnings from different departments of very uh, rare cases, uh, but also cases they would see quite often. And this was very important for us to have this uh, store of knowledge captured because care was becoming uh, increasingly complex, uh, increasingly uh, specialized. So a patient could have many different conditions. A nurse would see a patient that might have something with his kidney, something with his heart, that have diabetes. Uh, so how to treat uh, these complex patients, what to focus on, that's a real challenge for modern healthcare. And our doctors uh, and nurses helped each other um, with uh, these patients um, by uh, turning all these patient cases into e-learnings. Um, so a rich uh, store of e-learnings was produced this way. And this is what uh, I call workplace knowledge transfer. Um, so um, something that um, the doctors immediately recognized that they found useful for their everyday um, activities, but also for their personal development as a professional. And if you um, are in the L&D sphere, uh, you know um, probably also Jane Hart, uh, her uh, um, book, uh, uh, Modern Workplace Learning. So um, you really uh, treat um, all your learners, not as learners, um, but as workers, they come there um, to work. And ideally, they um, have all the training uh, immediate, with immediate relevance to their work. So sifting out um, what actually matters uh, to the workflow, uh, to the workplace, that's pretty hard. But uh, through our model, where um, basically the doctors and the nurses created their own e-learnings, that was less of an issue because most of the training created had a direct relevance to their practice. Um, that was uh, one example of a primary process. Uh, now I'll give a, uh, an example of a secondary process. A lot of um, information um, going around in your company um, is put in different places. So on the company SharePoint, the internet, uh, sometimes on the LMS system, um, but also a lot of knowledge is captured in a standard operating procedure. Um, and if um, uh, an employee can't find it or they're looking for quick help, they'll call the help desk and they'll um, expect someone to give them the answer. Um, a lot of this um, information uh, that is out there um, was created uh, by the experts um, and in order to help and facilitate um, uh, the workflow. But you could still see also in uh, the case of my hospital, that uh, the help desk received a lot of phone calls about different uh, simple uh, activities, but also programs that they got stuck in. And their immediate reaction was not to look on the internet or SharePoint or the LMS for all this different information. Uh, their immediate reaction would be to phone the help desk. Um, so what the help desk did was um, together um, with some colleagues uh, at different departments, they kind of coalesced uh, different information that was out there. They looked at the tickets that they received at the help desk. They looked at uh, the programs that they got the most questions on. And then they uh, looked at, do we have um, some material on that to help um, our employees um, uh, with, ever, with whatever issue they might have? And all the information was out there, but it was just that, that information. So um, once um, these professionals started to use ease to generator, they kind of blended all that information. Um, they added some questions, they added some examples, and they turned that into e-learnings. So in a way, blending informational and instructional design. And they did not see themselves as instructional designers at all, but there was a real uh, need uh, to uh, gather this information that they received a lot of tickets on, that they offered a lot of support on, and kind of turn it into an instruction. So that became um, e-learning that many employees followed, a quick course, which had the most uh, often problems uh, jotted down in the e-learning and what they could do to fix it themselves. And that reduced, reduced a lot of tickets. Uh, that meant that the information was not spread out all over, but that that uh, was um, captured in an e-learning. One such uh, e-learning um, 
had to do with uh, compliance to the GDPR. So if you're a European company, no doubt uh, you have, will have heard of the GDPR. Um, and um, in order to have our employees comply, a lot of information was spread out, different tips on uh, when you access a patient file, what should you do, what should you not do. So they kind of coalesced everything that had to do with both patient care and research and privacy. And um, the experts uh, on this, our privacy officers, um, uh, they initially turned it into an e-learning. And they also had the assistance uh, of a co-author uh, of a medical expert who kind of looked at it from the medical point of view. So the uh, privacy officer thought, well, it's important because if we don't follow the rules, then we can get a fine. Whereas the medical expert really uh, was more in tune with uh, the workspace. So he was like, no, I think this is important because I want to protect my patient's privacy. So um, together they uh, came up with an e-learning that both addressed uh, the client side, uh, so the patient protection, but also uh, uh, the side that might appeal more internally to the HR. And together they came up with this e-learning that coalesced all these different bits of information into one e-learning. So this is just one example of um, people who don't see themselves as instructional designers, but who do provide information a lot of turning that information into e-learnings and that it was a secondary business process. So moving from these uh, cases again to the slightly more abstract level, what does this mean? Uh, this means that the business experts um, have a new autonomy in coming up uh, with ideas for e-learnings and creating those uh, e-learnings themselves. And um, you see that most of these e-learnings have a direct relevance to the work of themselves and the work of their colleagues, either making it easier for themselves, as, as just mentioned in my uh, example, or uh, actually aiding their colleagues, um, which is often the case in the primary business processes. So uh, who in this case um, is allowed to create e-learnings? Well, in our organization, that was pretty much anyone who sought to improve business processes by effectuating a change that required learning new processes, skills, competencies, attitudes, or behaviors. And the learner was pretty much anyone affected by these changes. So this was a very um, big uh, shift in terms of L&D looking at where the biggest training needs are um, to handing it down to the business for them to decide what are the training uh, needs within our units, um, where can I best assist my colleagues. And uh, for me, a very interesting uh, thing as an L&D professional um, was the motivation um, of the subject matter experts uh, to engage in this type of course creation and knowledge sharing. Um, well, um, being a bit of a nerd myself, I also did some academic um uh, i looked at some some websites for articles academic uh, articles and i found a very interesting one uh, of a sister hospital of ours uh, which is the academic medical center amsterdam which actually um did the survey it was published by a, an ma student on the motivation of hospital staff to engage in knowledge sharing uh, well, what they come up with, uh, first of all, uh, this, is prob this is probably the medical, medical experts um, who mentioned this, was that they wanted to share information that would improve the quality of care. So right away, a business objective. What they also mentioned was that they would like uh, to solve job problems for their, co for their colleagues. That was one big motivation to engage in online knowledge sharing, but also to save time for their colleagues. And then, um, which was probably more uh, in line with the HR staff, is that they also mentioned that they uh, wanted to suggest new ways to improve performance, that they wanted to sift out the valuable information from the less valuable, but also to spread awareness on the most up-to-date job protocols. So this is very interesting. Um, if you look at it, uh, these are all business-minded motivations. Whereas you look at it from an L&D perspective, why do we engage in course creation? It is because we've, we have identified a certain training need or we've been asked to create trainings oftentimes. It has to do with compliance. A big project was just launched that requires training. And you see that uh, once you leave it up to the business, the motivation um, is much more in line with their day-to-day -day activities on the work uh, uh, floor. 
So um, this was a very interesting research for me, but it also was very recognizable in terms of when I ask and speak to our course creators, the employees, why do you create uh, courses? Oftentimes one of these reasons will pop up, which is a big difference uh, from having to create courses. Because I often get, get asked, uh, but what about time? Don't uh, the professionals um, um, object because they don't have time to create courses? Well, I say, yeah, that's the case when um, I'm asking them to create something. But when they come up with their own ideas, then time really isn't an issue. They'll find ways to make time. So what are the consequences uh, in terms of learning um, of this new approach that we took? Um, well, it was, um, like I mentioned, from learning by design to challenge a problem-based learning. There is usually when employees come up with an idea to create a course um, that there is a concrete problem that they're looking to solve. And um, from a learning perspective, uh, why is this so effective? Why was the pickup and the views of the employee generated content so much higher than the uh, vendor purchase content? Well, it has to do with a much older uh, principle, that of mentoring, that of having uh, a course uh, that was created uh, by someone you might look up to, someone who has expertise in your organization, who made it with the motivation to share that information and knowledge he has with his colleagues. And that's the mentoring principle that uh, the EGL model, I think, heavily relies on. What does this mean for L&D? Well, it means you uh, are able to facilitate much more on bringing out and encouraging this motivation in the employees of um, sharing knowledge with their colleagues, but also to consume the courses or encourage learning. Uh, you can then, if you uh, focus uh, your time, uh, not on instructional design, uh, but on how training is delivered, you look at what kind of resistance is there uh, by the management or whatever, what sort of conditions can we, a change in order to facilitate uh, the learning. So then you're looking at alignment uh, between uh, the business uh, and learning. You're seeing at what can we change in our business to facilitate learning, uh, enhancing the accessibility of trainings, uh, creating learning communities, uh, establishing cross-departmental or cross-organization learning connections. Uh, these are all added advantages that you um, can spend much more time on as an L&D professional once this instructional design aspect is taken out of your hands and put in the hands of the employees. Moving on um, to another case study, very interesting one, uh, where um, because of um, employees' ability to create courses, what they came up with was uh, ideas to um, have courses delivered to their colleagues but also then uh, modify them and change them. So the clients in this, ter in this case, our patient also benefited from these courses. So um, one uh, big problem uh, that many physicians identified and where they all came up with their own ideas for addressing this program uh, was how to address patients that had low health literacy C skills. So they um, showed up at the hospital um, without having a clear idea what to expect. Uh, they don't always ask the right questions or indicate uh, where the actual problem is. Uh, so different physicians at different departments have di had different ways of dealing with this issue of talking to patients. So um, some of these um, physicians came together and said, well, we need to standardize. And how do we standardize it? We, are, we can do it through an e-learning where we uh, kind of uh, tell our best practices, give tips on how to approach these patients. Um, and this was a very successful and popular e-learning because almost every physician dealt with this problem. And then they modified this e-learning and actually turned it into a patient uh, version. So patients um, at different uh, departments that had issues articulating their problem or asking the right questions or remembering all the information that was provided to them. They also got to see this e-learning in a slightly different form on how to ask those right questions, um, how to make sure that they remembered all the information. So uh, this, this project was pretty popular. Actually, a paper uh, was published on it uh, in terms of cost effectiveness. This actually improved care and saved healthcare costs. So this is a direct uh, way of in initiatives uh, by um, our employees actually contributing 
to one of the business goals, which, which is to cut costs. Then another uh, example uh, that was cross-organizational training. Um, well, being a hospital, um, uh, we had certain strengths, areas we were really good at, areas we were not so good at. And in order to valorize um, the practices and skills that our physicians were really good at, um, we also engaged in organizational trainings, which means that uh, physicians wanted to create trainings for other our hospitals, sister organizations, but also uh, sub-departments of our own hospital. Well, one of these uh, was the um, organ care, where transplant patients who receive a new organ, heart, liver, kidneys. Um, our hospital uh, was uh, really good at this. So we really excelled in certain techniques to perform these surgeries. And other hospitals in Europe, uh, they kind of lacked this skill. Um, they were not as good uh, in terms of numbers and keeping organs alive, and saving patient lives. So uh, we set up trainings, uh, paid trainings for uh, staff from other hospitals where they could take these trainings. That was a two-year online course, different semesters. And there was a huge uh, demand for these trainings. And then only two weeks, uh, they showed up at our hospital to get uh, physical training face-to-face -face in order to actually practice these skills. And the demand was many times uh, greater than what we could supply uh, simply because we lacked space and time for the face-to-face -face trainings. Whereas for the e-learnings, there was a huge demand. And this, uh, you can actually see e-learning being integrated into our business model. So training other organizations. And you might say, well, the medical sector is very specific in this regard because uh, why would we? want to sell our trainings, but you could also look this from another side uh, as training clients, training resellers, training partner organizations, almost every organization partners with other organizations, either in, our, uh, in research and development uh, or in other areas where you can actually use e-learning to share that knowledge. And this was not uh, an L&D initiative. This was certainly something that uh, our physicians themselves came up with. Um, to move on, um, what does this actually mean for the business? How can you uh, keep an eye that everything will go well once you adopt this model? Um, well, what I saw um, in my own uh, hospital was that a, a best practice kind of gradually emerged. So we had different areas where employee generated learning was really successful. Um, these areas are outlined here in the four squares. And also the added value of having uh, the experts, the subject matter experts, create these courses. So one area where it had a lot of effect was the primary business processes. So uh, what I uh, talked about in my first example of doctors becoming uh, better doctors and delivering better care. A lot of these e-learnings um, were made for the less experienced uh, doctors by the more experienced. Whenever someone um, joined an apartment as a new doctor, they would often get an intensive instruction as well. And a lot of this instruction uh, was put into e-learnings. Uh, so the primary business of actually uh, making care better was an important area. And you could, could kindly self see that self-regulating because uh, they were the experts um, anyhow who created the e-learnings and did the trainings for their departments. Uh, you could kind of see that um, have a further reach. So that became kind of cross department where one training was not just effective in one department, but also in other departments, which kind of allowed the best practice to emerge and for the expert to actually look critically at what they were teaching. Uh, because they now turned it into an e-learning. Uh, another um, area where EGL um, is still very successful is the compliance learning. Um, and I added but fun because uh, compliance learning isn't um, the most fun oftentimes when you have to learn about SOPs, about uh, code of conduct, uh, about different protocols. Um, but when our employees set about creating it, they also looked at ways of actually adding that fun element into training. Um, so a lot of our compliance training, they um, 
um, invited people to join. There were a lot of open questions uh, used, uh, a lot of visual information presented in the e-learning. So these compliance trainings that uh, experts made, often in conjunction um, with experts from the workspace, um, so kind of cross-functional projects these became with different authors working together on these projects. Um, they turned out some very good e-learnings and they also um, used a lot of the feedback. So Easy Generator not only um, logs um, uh, the results, it also logs uh, what type of answers were given, how many times someone answered it incorrectly. They went through the course really quickly. So a lot of this uh, feedback information, um, but also a satisfaction survey, that kind of information was then integrated to make their trainings better. Uh, another area where kind of a best practice emerged and where um, the authors kind of looked at each other, um, what are they uh, creating? Um, that was the orientation training. We had one big general orientation training for everyone who came new to the hospital uh, that was turned into an e-learning by our HR department. And um, we also saw that um, orientations were very department specific, so they had to um, find their way around the department, get to know um, who the management is, who the direct colleagues are, what different roles at the department. So we as an L&D department could never actually make the e-learning so specific. But we did see that once uh, um, the communication experts or anyone at the department who was responsible for onboarding, when they used the Easy Generator, they finally could make those onboardings really specific. And this is uh, what I mentioned, where they kind of look at each other, what is another department uh, making, and also kind of best practice in terms of orientation arose that way. And then uh, finally, an area um, where EGL had a lot of impact was with projects. So every organization will have a lot of projects going on, new software being introduced, new ways of, uh, of working, new processes. And these all had to be communicated in some way. And when I uh, was at the L&D department, we still had the instructional design model. What you would see is that the process, project um, would only come to us in the complete uh, completion stage and then ask, uh, okay, so now how do we think about communicating this uh, big change into our organization? So with Easy Generator, a lot of these project managers and project staff they had a way of, from the outset, already looking at, okay, uh, what kind of tool uh, um, can we use to um, spread uh, the word about our change, about how to use this new software. And um, from the outset, they were already, um, whilst they were uh, rolling out the project and project designing, they were also using Easy Generator to come up with training designs synchronously with their projects. So instead of uh, then uh, having something at the end, training is an afterthought. A lot of these project managers were very excited about Easy Generator because as they, as the project went along, they also improved their own e-learnings. And so once the project uh, went live, they also rolled out the e-learning e into the organization. So that was one um, um, benefit that EGL had. It really supported the projects in our organization. Um, so my main point uh, with this slide is to um, tell you that instead of uh, there being an anarchy um, of so many different e-learnings on different topics uh, without kind of a best practice, a best quality arising, that wasn't the case. Actually, we saw quality improving in a lot of areas of training, such as the orientation trainings, which became much more specific, compliance training, which were much more fun, the primary business uh, processes, which thanks to the mentoring process, uh, mentoring principle uh, became much more interesting for colleagues to follow because it was created by one of their colleagues instead of it, them seeing it as something created by the L&D department uh, imposed on them. And also the project managers were very, very excited about Easy Generator. And because they could uh, cooperate, they could look at what uh, the others were building, a kind of best practice also emerged, um, where we had, as the more e-learnings were being created, the bigger this best practice uh, got, and already the nicer the onboarding trainings got, the better the compliance trainings got. 
I um, have a number of takeaways um, that I want to leave you with before we get into the questions. One takeaway is that uh, enabling the subject matter uh, experts to create courses then puts business value at the heart of corporate learning and teaching. So what I talked about, um, the e-learnings that were being created were very business-minded. They often had a specific business uh, goal in mind. In um, my previous organization, a hospital in the healthcare se setting, uh, this brought a lot of new opportunities for streamlining um, the learning and teaching pro uh, processes. And also for uh, what I just mentioned, the cross-organization training, which was something we did not engage in. But thanks to e, uh, EC Generator, a lot of pro, uh, projects started up that actually had different organizations participating in it from different hospitals in the Netherlands, but also in Europe. And we also made a part of a business model. So we actually solved uh, those trainings. What does this mean for L&D? Uh, this means actually uh, shifting the focus um, from providing learning content to your employees more, more towards encouraging and bringing out uh, the learning motivation in the employees. And um, a democracy means involving all areas of your business. So once East Generator was out there, it was well known. Uh, you saw it being picked up for a range of training purposes. And um, because of this, a kind of best practice uh, of EGL employee-generated learning arose within our organization, which actually contributes it to the quality of courses that were being produced. So that was the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And I wonder if someone left questions in the chat. I'm sure yeah. Molly or Casper can tell me. Yes, I will, I will guide you through them. So thanks, Gerrit, a really insightful presentation. Well done. And yes, we have a bunch of questions, so let's see how far we can get uh, in the time we have. Um, so the first one is from Tom Jones. Uh, he says, as a designer, one of the biggest challenges I face is trying to overcome the cultural perception of e-learning in organization. I'm struggling to change the mindset of, I have to spend an hour of doing e-learning to, I have saved two hours by doing e-learning rather than ILT. Any suggestions uh, that you have here on how to change that mindset? But then we're talking about the learner, not the author, of course. Yeah, well, that's a big ambition uh, for L&D to change uh, the learning mindset. I think it has to, uh, the proof has to be in the pudding. In my organization, we also had two or three hour e-learnings that were mandatory. And that idea still lived with a lot of uh, people about this is e-learning. Um, I think a lot of it comes from the author side. Um, so once the uh, experts uh, started creating courses, they made sure their colleagues uh, uh, followed them uh, because uh, they put a lot of time and effort into them. Uh, so that was, a, I think, the biggest shift in the learning culture where the author involvement became a lot more uh, and a lot stronger um, thanks to having this different model than L&D actually trying to change learning culture and trying to change people's perception of e-learning. And also, I think, um, which is also valuable to mention, is that e-learnings generally became shorter. So when employees create e-learnings, they sometimes didn't create a whole big e-learning. They made it very to the point. So not a huge theoretical introduction, but only a quick uh, bite-sized information that uh, their colleagues could then use. So I think, um, yeah, once the authors start creating, that mindset will change um, gradually. I think your biggest um, task will then be uh, convincing the management of uh, the value of this approach. Um, and then the organizational shifts and changes will come. Yeah, and uh, from my end also, uh, a lot of things can be said. So one of the other things is really, it has a lot to do with the quality of the learning and the, uh, how engaging it is. But also there is a shift happening from top down to bottom up. And the motivation issue only is with top-down learning, so mandatory training that you push into the organization. And what we see happening more and more is that a learning and development department leave it up to the learner uh, to decide what to learn and when to learn. And then that motivation problem goes away because they initiate learning by themselves because they are in the need for to learn something. So then it becomes a really different uh, approach. I agree, yeah. So the second question uh, is from Natalia Del Clo. Probably. I'm not sure if I pronounced her name correctly. I hope I did. Um, so she wants to know, is it possible to have pre-created and maintained content by a team of specialists 
make it available to trainers and that those trainers can add a specific uh, piece towards it. Uh, maybe I can answer that uh, briefly by in each generator, you have co-authoring capabilities. You also have the ability to uh, reuse sections, so chapters basically. So what you could do is create like a, a bunch of default sections, put them into a course uh, by a, or a co-author can pull them into a course and add his own sections to that. So that way you would be able to do that. So let's move to the question of Federico Carvalho. Um, and that's a big one. Uh, it's a small question, but it was a large answer probably. And uh, I know that you have an opinion on that, Fiat. So that's interesting. Um, this question is, that is on his mind since day one. <laughs> How do you assure the quality of the content versus the motivation to share knowledge? So what about quality? Um, it's, it's a very legitimate question, I think, by Federico. Uh, one is, um, who is in charge of quality? Do you see it as the L&Ds? responsibility to ensure the quality of all the information sharing and training that goes on. Um, from the outset, we uh, saw this as a huge challenge uh, for us uh, to, uh, to see ourselves this way in terms of uh, creating courses, being responsible for them, because a lot of the training in the organization was outside of our field of vision. So it was very easy for us to say, okay, we're not responsible for that because they were using PowerPoints. They were using shoulder-to-shoulder uh, -shoulder techniques where we had no um, oversight over that at all. So we could not do quality monitoring by having them actually create e-learnings and making that knowledge into a different form um, 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 where actually um, it was less dependent on the individual instructor or the individual expert. Um, that way you actually saw that um, um, we could keep a lot more uh, oversight in terms of uh, the quality of what was being produced. So it has to do with how you look at yourself as uh, a quality agent and also a bit of trust uh, in the experts and in the trainers uh, that they will uh, create qualitatively high courses. And also in this case, I think the proof is in the pudding. Uh, proof of the pudding is in the eating, sorry. Uh, we never had huge complaints uh, that the quality uh, was really bad because being a healthcare sector, um, of course, you want to make sure people learn the right things. But you see these training initiatives and ideas, um, they were um, already in their uh, heads and already um, were part of what they wanted to communicate and uh, teach their colleagues. So actually, thanks to having a lot more e-learning out there created by the employees, uh, we actually um, saw all this come into our field of vision and the quality oversight actually benefited, I think, from uh, from having all these e-learning created by the experts. But that is my opinion. And like you said, Casper, it's a very strong one on this. Yeah. But like, like I always say, if someone created a PowerPoint and or someone did a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder training on their own accord, it's very easy for us to then say, okay, uh, it's not my responsibility and I don't want to look over their shoulder. Actually, when they now make e-learnings, it's a lot easier and they feel a lot more responsibility for the quality of their own instruction. Yeah, it does make sense. But indeed, I was surprised the first time you told me this uh, view because, well, if errors are made, potentially people can actually die in hospital. So uh, that, that uh, it actually turns out that you have more faith in the quality this way uh, is really, really uh, insightful for me. Uh, from my end, by the way, there are also, by the way, two parts on quality. Uh, it's instructional design quality, so how well is it being made, and the correctness of the course. So for the course, uh, if it's correct or not, we have a feature in this generator, uh, the review feature. So you can, eat, uh, so because the L&D department will not be able to judge that, so you can invite your coworkers to look at your course and to give uh, feedback to make sure it's correct. We always advise to use that review function before publishing a course. And the other thing is that uh, instructional designers are there to help out with uh, designing and creating uh, the course. We also have really, really, really good support at Easy Generator. So 24-5, uh, any time of the day, you can type in a question in the support chat and the people sitting there, and they're actually people, not bots, the people sitting there, they're not only really knowledgeable about Easy Generator, but by, uh, also about e-learning. We can even review your course for you if you are in doubt uh, for the SME, if the, if the content is not good enough. So we actually help them a lot. And we are, by the way, um, working on adding more tools into the, uh, the Easy Generator to help certain experts. So first one will be what we call the Easy Assistant. It's uh, we just uh, in the design process of that. 
it is like a, a design wizard where they just have to answer questions and then based on questions we will actually create a course structure for them also guiding them more into actionable content instead of knowledge sharing and uh, on top of that, we are looking in what we call the course quality meter. It's sort of uh, basically an in, an, a built-in instruction designer easy generator that has a lot of knowledge on uh, instruction design rules, didactical rules, writing rules, um, and uh, based on that, gives advice at the author while he's writing. So we are going to facilitate that there as well. Okay, we have a bit more time. Another question from Sima. I'm sure a lot of planning collaboration is done in these scenarios presented here. Those are the scenarios that you just presented, Geert. How did you motivate senior doctors to create e-learning content, considering their role, busy schedule, urgency, stuff like that? Yeah, well, to do again, uh, this was kind of the mindset uh, shift, um, as opposed to me as an L&D uh, professional initiating these projects. It was actually those physicians themselves that initiated these proje uh, projects because they could see it actually save uh, time for themselves or their colleagues, or they simply thought this would improve the quality of care. Uh, so once uh, this was their motivation, they made sure they found time uh, for it. And these were collaborative uh, projects. Uh, so especially when uh, people from other hospitals or from outside uh, our country were collaborating, it was um, good if uh, one person uh, actually kept oversight. Uh, so that's always good to have one main author kind of gets in touch uh, with the other authors. Um, but in terms of actually um, having them uh, free up time uh, to work on the projects, we saw that that was less of an issue, much less of an issue than whereas I initiated the process. I had to um, gather all of them together at certain times to co collect their input to see if I did it right or not uh, in terms of course creation. Whereas if, if when they sat down and created the courses, you could see that uh, they also felt that it as a responsibility to create time. So it's no different in terms of project planning and project management from any other project. The main difference is I'm not the project manager for all these projects. It's actually the work uh, floor who, who initiates and who oversees these projects. That's very really interesting because uh, it's one of the ideas behind the approach of easy generator, which we call m learning, to make the business responsible for more things. And what you tell us is that both on level for quality, but also for the level of, of basically making time to do things, it also changed the mindset because it becomes their responsibility to do it. And it's not something mm -hmm. that is sort of pushed onto them. So mm -hmm. um, I think with that, we are uh, at the end of our time. So thank you very much, Geert. Uh, really insightful, love the presentation. And uh, if you have more questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. We will then uh, take them uh, separately and answer them.
Well, with that, it is four o'clock. See people from Canada, the US, London, Colombia. Well, I think we're sort of all over the place. Okay, um, yeah, let's start. So, young case, uh, welcome uh, 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 this presentation um, about uh, building a financial business case for L&D in, in a time of recession. And uh, I know you're the right person to talk about this because uh, you're now the CEO of Visa Generator. Before that, you were the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer of KPN, which is uh, the largest telco in the Netherlands. And before that, you were the Minister of Finance. So um, welcome, and uh, maybe you can do your own uh, short introduction uh, self. Okay, yeah, yeah, happy, happy. Well, you, I think the most relevant part you already mentioned. I think my the credibility for this uh, presentation would be probably a former chief financial officer of KPN, uh, a publicly listed uh, company, and a former finance minister of the Netherlands. But now, of course, uh, much more important, we are one of the uh, founders of uh, Easy Generator in the past, before I went to the politics, and now very happy to uh, have resumed my original entrepreneurial career at Easy Generator. And uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Casper. Uh, so let us move to the um, uh, the takeaways of this uh, presentation. I, I'm Is the screen shared now? Because I, I still see Casper. Right now, give me a sec. Um, I will share my screen. Now, so now everybody should be able to see your presentation and just yeah, uh, that, 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 the next page. Yeah, that's already good. Yeah, you can already take us to the next slide. Um, so the takeaways for this presentation is how can you graphic from a global recession and, and engage your CFO during difficult times? Uh, why employee generated learning is the most sustainable type of learning? Uh, we also have business cases and examples of that uh, by means of Casper as well. And what customer gained from actually adopting employee generated uh, learning, also in the business cases, in practical business cases. Um, so it is very important to know, and if you can see that also on the back on the next uh, slide, that uh, there will be always a recovery from a global uh, recession. So the, the, we, we are, and that's the consensus of, of almost everybody, we are heading uh, into, if not already, in a recession at the moment. Uh, maybe not a very deep one, uh, we still not know, but it could be a little bit prolonged one. Uh, there are several analysts about that. Uh, but let's first look at the history of recessions. It's interesting always to look, if you want to look forward, always learn from the history. And from this graph, we see about a, uh, 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 150 years of um, uh, economic development of growth in global heads per GDP. And the world, of course, has faced numerous crises in this period. But interestingly is that what we see that the COVID downfall of the economy, the contraction during COVID, actually was the largest contraction since we are measuring besides the uh, the second, uh, you could say be second, because the world wars uh, are a little bit more, you cannot see that here in this graph, but a little bit more than that. But uh, the COVID contraction was um, uh, a very, very strong contraction in, uh, in, in, in world economic history. But you also see a very sharp recovery as well. So we are now at the very high recovery point, a very sharp uh, downwards and a very sharp recovery. This is a typical V-shaped recovery, which is actually quite typical for a pandemic or any crisis, a short-term crisis, uh, also if we look at it in the past. However, uh, now it seems that we are heading into a more uncertain period following the uh, recovery of the pandemic uh, because of the, uh, the war situation in, in the eastern part of Europe, um, the continuous COVID situation in some parts of Asia. So the, 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 you could, the global energy crisis and um, uh, 
commodities that have been uh, become very expensive also to produce in, in the West uh, further goods. So we have seen a lot of recent uncertainty this year added to the post-pandemic um, uh, recovery, which means also that uh, it is very likely that we are going into a recession. And a very typical answer in a recession is always to cut your budget, which is which is understandable because you are in survival mode. Uh, but uh, what we have seen from the last recession, many companies that laid off a lot of people during their downfall, the strong uh, downfall, were having a lot of difficulty in getting back talent again after getting out of this crisis. So in a sharp recovery, as we have seen in the post-pandemic era, uh, it was super difficult and very costly for many companies or organizations to recover from the layoffs that they did and to, and again, hire new talent. And the ones that actually retained talent, retained uh, resources, or were very early to um, grow again in resources, were the ones best off because the ones late in that game on the recovery uh, cycle in the economy were not doing very well. Uh, because they were entering into a super competitive labor market and already most of the talent was already uh, hired. So it was a very difficult situation. That is interestingly, let's go to the next slide. That is interestingly because um, we, today we are talking about the um, uh, about, about investing in learning and development uh, during a crisis. And also when you look back, for example, during the 2008-2009 crisis, there is overwhelming evidence that companies that have invested in learning and development during that crisis have seen much better performance uh, financially than during uh, the uh, than the companies that did not invest and only cut their budgets in the 2008-2009 crisis, and that evidence of past crises also with the um the experience the, the which is much uh, uh, closer by the experience that we have seen in the post pandemic recovery that the ones that laid off uh, too quickly or were late in rehiring, we we're having a lot of difficulties in recovery because the talent was not there anymore. So that experience, that recent experience of the post-pandemic recovery and added to the somewhat longer crisis that we have seen in 2008, 2009, 2010, that actually companies that continue to invest in L&D did much better in, uh, than, than their competitors, is a very interesting point to make to your C-level uh, suite, suite, uh, suite uh, in your company, to the CEO and the CFO. So if we go to the next um, slide, um, we can say that uh, there are many reasons, and we will go into that later, that it is important to keep investing in uh, your people also during the lows in an economic, economic uh, situation. And even there is now a more compelling argument compared to only the 2008 2009 um, evidence that we see that during crisis it's best to keep investing in people and keep investing in l d uh, also the recent recovery the very sharp recovery of the pandemic and as as a result of that the difficulty of getting in uh, the talent or retaining the talent before that um underlines that but there's also so if you know that you don't want to lay off all your people because you you have to retain some of them um it's interesting because then you have a two-sided sword actually that you have you retain some talent because you want to have enough talent at the time of recovery and um and you have capacity to share knowledge because those people, those people have a lot of knowledge in your company. So you want to retain them and at the same time capture that knowledge. And at the same time, employees have also a bit more time to spare to learn as well. So there are employees. So when, if you do not want to immediately lay off all your capacity and retain some part because the, the recent evidence is there that you do not want to um, uh, lay off a lot of uh, people during the crisis, not everybody, because you need them again on a recovery. You have some time left uh, for those people because not everybody is utilized to the maximum. 
use that time, utilize that time for those people that retained all that knowledge for years and years, some even decades in your company, um, use that time that they capture that knowledge and can also transfer that knowledge to new generations, to new employees. That takes a little bit of time, but not that much. And also your employees have time to learn as well. And the interesting of course, point, of course, is then you really are at the sweet spot of employee generated learning, because that means you are best off with a tool that doesn't cost you extra out of pocket costs, but you utilizes the time that you already have a spare in your organization to capture the knowledge that is there to capture for um, the knowledge of years and years and even sometimes decades in organization to bring forward for the new generations for the new years to come. So if we could go to the next uh, slide, we see that uh, companies with full training programs generate 218% more income per employee than those who don't. That's, that's very significant. That's very significant. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, research by the ATD, the Association for Talent Development, and it's a very significant metric that you also can utilize in the business case. We come uh, later to that for your um, uh, your C uh, level of management, your CFO and your CEO, because that's typically as added with the other arguments that I gave a very important point. Let's go to the next slide, because having all that knowledge uh, about how to make it better uh, for your company and how to utilize even a recession into your own benefit uh, to improve L&D, um, improve learning and development, and to actually utilize the time that will be freed up to capture a lot of the knowledge so you can secure it for the next generation of uh, employees. You, of course, you need a business case and you need to engage your C-level and a very good way to start is at your CFO. Your CFO and your CEO are basically uh, looking for the same thing. They're very much normally aligned, aligned on strategic, but also on cost goals. And um, uh, the uh, how to engage your um, CFO is a very important point. And I've been for almost six years CFO and be before that, I was uh, almost six years uh, the finance minister and secretary of state of finance in the Netherlands. So I have worked in that capacity and I know how these business cases work. Uh, and it's very important, and I cannot stress this enough, it's very important that even when your CFO asks you to cut spend, to cut budget, Actually, that's not his main concern. Of course, a CFO always likes to see lower cost uh, and increase the, the bottom line. Um, your top line is your revenue, then you have your costs, and the bottom line is everything that remains after uh, deducting uh, operational spends. Um, but actually, the CFO is even more concerned about value creation. That's the main thing. So let's go to the next uh, slide. Value creation is extremely important, what your CFO is targeting at, more important even than cost cutting. Cost cutting is also important. And then, of course, it is very helpful that employee generated learning, by the way, is typically at a much, comes at a much lower cost, a much lower spend than your normal formal learning process, both in time utilized, but also in out of pocket costs to external parties. But it's more than that. It's not only the cost benefit that employee generated learning can bring you during a recession. It's mostly about the value uh, generation you can make. And creating value, especially during times of crisis, is actually what the CFO looks like, looks at. Uh, so here we see a quadrant that Easy Generator made. We are the, uh, the, the, you could say, the inventors of employee generated learning. We started many years ago with that model. And you see in your top left, you see um, that everything started with, uh, in history with formal learning. We have done that for hundreds of years, actually thousands of years. Everything what we did in human history normally started with formal learning. Teachers that were teaching their knowledge, transferring the knowledge top down, uh, from the one that has knowledge 
and uses its time uh, to um, uh, to educate other people. But interestingly enough, also in history, there was, especially when we we're talking about skills, for 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 centuries, there was a very strong in arts and crafts, for example, a very strong different type of peer-to-peer -peer education as well. And it was much more already avant la lettre, you could say, before the 20th century started and each generator started, really employee generated learning, do it at online. You already had the apprentice model and not with a formal teacher, but with a person that had a very good ability, a very good skill in painting or in crafts or um, in, 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 in making sure horses were uh, right and etc. In centuries, there was also a model of apprenticeship and learning the, the way of, from your peers. And this is what happened in, what actually in the, in the beginning of the 21st century happened when we moved slowly from formal learning again, because at some point in time, we did away with that. We did away with uh, the apprenticeship and we everything was put in schools and formal learning, etc. And the 20th century was an industrialization and a lot of things happened. And one of the things we lost a little bit of the art of apprenticeship that was there before with the, in the arts and crafts period of the Middle Ages until the 18th and even 19th century. Uh, but now in the, the beginning of the 21st century, we, you could say in a very modern way, we invented that model of knowledge transfer and easy generator contributed that to that with the employee generated uh, learning. And we made it because we were the first one really to immense, emancipate that model, that we made a tool so easy to use, like the, with the ease of PowerPoint, that you can use to use every subject matter expert, every person in a company that carries knowledge, or knowledge that has knowledge, that, that can use some time, some of its time, his or her time, to transfer knowledge, by means not in the old fashioned way by to one person to a person, but in e-learning much more efficient and much more effective. So hence the era of knowledge transfer came in uh, into place. And that was a very defining moment of a tool that was so easy, so super easy to use that we could use the persons that actually have the knowledge that is every from a day to day does the certain tasks or is involved or tasked by for that task in a company is able to use a tool to capture their knowledge to transfer the knowledge into an e-learning um, uh, course. In a matter of a few hours, you can already create course content as a subject matter expert. You don't need the formal way of learning again anymore. And then also we are gradually, besides knowledge transfer, which will still remain very important, by, by the way, also formal learning will still be there in, for example, very top-down compliance uh, courses, language learning, um, uh, uh, teaching accounting methods that do not change that much over time, but everything that is every content, every every knowledge that has some specific skill set or is time sensitive is ideal uh, for uh, employee generated learning and knowledge transfer. It's a long long tail of the learning e learning is actually there in that part. Um, uh, where employee generated learning is much more efficient and much more effective than in the short tail of formal learning, which will still be there. But knowledge, uh, so it, the th these quadrants do not replace each other. They, you could say they add each other on top of each other. So after knowledge transfer, now we see more and more also performance support happening as well. And that is something that is, um, uh, uh, it's not about what you know, you could say, but what you can do. And learning-centric uh, organizations, again, will really outperform comp competitors and will do better for all the stakeholders, clients and employees. So content use for performance support could be and should be created by the employees typically because they know best, much better than formal outside people outside of the company, uh, the ones that normally generate more the formal learning, which is again, still there also, but that's a typical different type of uh, learning uh, part. And now we are exactly talking and 
Casper will talk about that later in the uh, business cases, which is the sweet spot of each generator. Content used for knowledge transfer and performance support should be created by employees because they are the best for that type of content. Again, formal learning is still there, and there's a lot of fields at formal learning. The short tail of e-learning that is 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 uh, one to very very many, but for specific knowledge transfer, for time sensitive knowledge transfer, and for performance support, that it will remain important. And the responsibility of creating learning content moves more towards the employees because they are really the subject matter experts. Yeah, let's take us to the next slide. So here, again, if we, if we use that knowledge about where the market is coming from formal learning to uh, new ways where employee generated learning is, is much better, there is always in a recession, I know that myself in KPN all, always, when there is a recession and you have to cut budget, the first thing is always learning that they will look at. Not maybe the fir first thing, but one of the first things. So the, one of the first things is always the learning. But you can build very easily a business case that maybe for the formal learning, you can still continue the courses that you already have done and, 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 and then, well, put a little bit of a break on developing the new formal learning there. But there is a lot of value to be created using a more modern, a more novel way of employee generated learning for knowledge transfer and performance support. So how do, how do you engage your CFO? You have to know, and your CEO, you have to know the language of the, the C uh, level people. And first of all, it's super important to lead your C-suite into a value creation agenda. I will, I will come to that later. Align learning investment with your business goals and strategy and achieve higher um, um, higher level uh, higher output by leveraging existing talent. Let's uh, start with the first point. Lead your C-suite in a value creation agenda. The next uh, slide, Kasper. Rather than only cost cutting, it is about value creation in the end. So yes, on the short term in survival mode, cost cutting is super important. And again, by the way, typically employee generated learning is also much more cost efficient than formal uh, ways of learning because you're utilizing your sources already there. And especially during a crisis, you have some always some redundant uh, resources and some redundant time, which you can utilize to the maximum of utilize, utilize that time for employees to capture and transfer uh, and share their knowledge. And um, you want, of course, a future-proof model. So yes, you want to be uh, in survival mode, but the CFO also wants to have some looming future positive perspective in the future on how to go forward after the crisis. And again, the post-pandemic recovery is a great example of that. That's happened very sharply. Not sure if this, in this case, it will be also so that, like a sharp recovery like that, but there will be recovery always after a recession. And you have to think as CFO has to think about that as well. And uh, employee generated learning is much more agile you can adapt much more easy. It's more cost effective. It was already much more cost effective before any crisis, even if you do not have spare time at your employees. And during times, challenging times, if you have spare time, it's ideal because um, it's almost at zero marginal cost or at, at zero marginal cost. You could create, you could capture and create a lot of knowledge. Uh, at, at almost zero marginal cost because you, you want to keep some of the resources, you don't want to lay off everything, and you can utilize those resources in times of crisis. And the ones, again, the ones that keep investing in the re re recession, we saw that in 2008, but there's also already enough anecdotal evidence about that in the uh, pandemic as well. The ones that did that are much better off during the recovery time. And so keep the main focus on value, rather than only cost. And of course, um, always think about, uh, present the case that costs less money because employee generate, uh, generated learning is cost effective, but make them love your agenda of value creation. And that is where you really, I think you will reach out to the CFO in his head by the cost aspect, but you will really will win his heart 
by a value creation agenda that you can easily make a business case uh, later on that also on the side of customer some examples you can easily make business cases that do that let's go to the next slide if you look at what ceos want they almost want the same thing as cfos but it's interesting there's a huge misalignment is what it is measured into an organization and what they feel what CEOs answer on the question uh, that um, uh, that is uh, is measured. This is measured by the ROI Institute, and there's two the two by far biggest misalignments are impact and ROI. ROI is return on investment, and there you see that impact it's is sad by CEOs on on their on 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 in the surveys. Only 8% says it's currently measured, but as 96, almost everybody says it should be measured. So a huge misalignment. And our ROI is 4% versus 74%. Still a huge misalignment on, uh, on what is measured and what should be measured. So typically very uh, a lot of L&D cases have a kind of, you could say, an approach that is purely qualitative, which is, of course, could. could but here, both CEOs and CFOs want to have a little bit more substance. And we gave already some, uh, uh, some sources for that. We can also offline after the uh, people can, uh, for, for some of the sources, we can also refer later to the uh, underlying documents, but you can also find out your own um, uh, ROI in your company. If you see, especially of course, uh, time spent of employees versus the, uh, the cost uh, that they will do. But you see that companies that have, by the way, this measured better, they also, that's not a surprise, are outperforming their competitors as well. So what the CEO and the CFO really want is you are able to measure better impact and return on investment in your business case. And I know it's, it's, it's difficult, but impact already can be measured by also surveying qualitative, by asking all the respondents of your company that did the e-learning courses. And return on investment is actually not that difficult. I can, we, in the Q&A, we can talk about it more if you want some examples on how you measure and measure ROA, ROI in a uh, business case on e-learning. But there are actually quite you could say easy basic points on how to put that into a spreadsheet that also CFO really understands. It's typically not done for L&D uh, developments, but I, I really urge that it should be done much more, especially on impact and ROI. All points here are uh, important, but uh, look at the misalignment. So this, will, again, you will really conquer the hearts of the CEO and the CFO if you're able to measure ROI and impact in your business case. Then a uh, second point is align learning investment with your business goals and strategy. And um, yeah, the, the slide, uh, the next slide. If you, uh, it's super important, the, the, the organization, I don't know what your purpose is and your uh, long-term goals and your short-term goals, uh, but there are targets for next year later maybe a little bit later for the uh, next budget and there are already long-term strategies in place refer also in your business case uh, to that i see a lot i've seen a lot of business cases in my past uh, presented also by l and d um, uh, departments that were not specifically related to short-term car targets and long-term strategies it really should be done and learning should be about impact behavior and behavior should be aligned with business goals. There's also a lot of evidence supporting that as well. And if you're able to connect that in your presentation, there's together with the points that are already addressed, there's already a much better um, a relation for the CEO and the CFO to understand. And then thirdly, the next slide, achieve higher output by leveraging existing talent. Companies always change, especially in recession. There will be more changes in the future. That is for sure. That is that is the certainty. That is the, the absolutely certainty that we know. That's the thing that doesn't change. That change will always be there. And changing workforce involves also huge hidden costs. Attrition is normal. 
And it's, we have seen the last two decades that it's becoming more and more and people are shorter in their life cycles. Also at companies in the last two and three decades, we have seen that also in, in, in big organizations, but also in smaller organizations. So the, the cost of onboarding people, new people, the, 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 the benefit of transferring knowledge of the previous generation to a new generation of work for workforce is more important than ever because we see shorter cycles of workforce happening in all types of organization. So the training the existing workforce is a much more cost effective thing than any other expenditure you can imagine. And this is typically undervalued in organizations that the change in behavior of employees of becoming um, less involved in organizations or shorter involved in organizations. And if they stay, even, even if they stay in the organization, they want to move up quicker. They are the, 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 the uh, Gen Z generation, uh, but it was already the millennials. They were, they are impatient. They want to move up the ladder. And if they cannot do that in the company, they will go out. But even if they move out uh, up in the, um, uh, in the ladder within an organization, especially if they move out, there's a lot of transformational cost of that. And e-learning, and especially in regenerated learning, is really the sweet spot to address that issue on how to transfer knowledge from generation to generation of workforces. And that was maybe 20, a generation of workforce could, could have been 10 years or 20 years, uh, uh, 40 years back. Uh, and now it is only a few years. People are very quickly in changing jobs and also within an organization to change uh, jobs as well. So it is super important to keep working on your current workforce and make with that transformation onboarding time shorter, more cost effective and um, transfer knowledge much faster. And also the capturing of knowledge with your current workforce that is going away. Uh, much quicker than in the past, capturing of that knowledge by means of an employee generated tooling, like each generator, which is easy to use, is has become much more important than uh, in the past. Okay, then I had it uh, handed back to Casper uh, for the um, for what types of learning um, uh, generates the most value. Yeah, thank you. So uh, if we look at that, we see that there are uh, different kinds of types and we will focus on three of them today. So employee generated learning uh, uh, is one of them. Um, Kasper, are you in, I, I, I am, are you in also in picture? Uh, yes, I am. I, I should be. Oh, I, oh, I see only myself. Okay, but that's yeah, fine. That, yeah, that, thank that's you. Uh, in, uh, in Zoom. Okay. Uh, so uh, the second one is bespoke e-learning, so uh, content created for specific purposes by uh, instructor designers. And the third one is classroom training. So we'll dive in a bit deeper into all of them. So starting with classroom training. So a lot of things are changing currently around classroom training. And of course, the whole COVID pandemic was a big boost for that. So a lot of training that was happening in the classroom was not possible anymore during COVID. So a lot of that training has been moved uh, through the web. Um, and the reason for that, of course, was then the pandemic and not being able to meet. But now organizations find that there is also a lot of benefit there moving away from this classroom training because classroom training is not really agile. Uh, it keeps employees off work. It is quite expensive because you have to bring everybody in the same, same location together. It can be rather slow depending on how it is. Uh, it, you cannot uh, self-pace it, so everybody has to follow the same thing. Um, so a lot of companies uh, sort of stick to the online training and move away from the classroom training because uh, the value is a bit there. And what we also see happening a lot is that people go into a blended mode, go back to the classroom for uh, soft skill training or the application, but put the knowledge part in an e-learning course. So classroom training is the first one. And what you see is that uh, if you move to online training, uh, Brandon Holt tells us that it will save you between 40 and 60% over face-to-face -face learning. Forbes will tell us that uh, online learners retain uh, 25 to 60% higher than face-to-face -face learners. By the way, that is if you do it in a proper way. So that, uh, that is a, a, a connotation with that. And um, uh, the, what you also see is the outcome of a research that was done. So what kind of learning delivery me uh, methods are expected to increase in the next year, year and a half. And then you see that self-paced e-learning 
is the biggest together with mobile learning, which is by the way, really closely connected. And then coaching video, instructor-led training, uh, it's all, all done and classroom-based uh, uh, instructor-led training is uh, on, the, on the lowest end of uh, things there. So things are moving more towards self-based learning and less to classroom training. So then go into bespoke e-learning. And I have been myself responsible for the creation of bespoke e-learning for a long time. And uh, there are a couple of issues there. So if you look at the process on how bespoke e-learning is created, um, you will see that uh, usually the learning and development department with an instructor designer is responsible for the creation of a learning uh, courses uh, or other learning material. And for, um, in order to get to, to, to build the training, they have to go to the business side uh, to get the information because the training is usually about a business topic. They don't know about that. So they have to interview people. So they talk to super experts, employees to get that information. They have to go back, put it in a course, check in with the super experts, make sure that they solve any conflicting input. And that process going back and forth will take a lot of time. And with that, it will also take a lot of money because it can take up to 240 hours, uh, research shows, to, to create one hour of e-learning. And the cost will be something between ten and thirty thousand dollars. So we can say that the creation of e of bespoke e learning is slow, and it is also expensive. But there is a bigger problem because the instructor designer is the one who is responsible for the creation of learning content and also for the publication. So when he's done, he will publish it in a learning management system, the LMS, and there the learner can go in and take the course. The problem is that the instruction designer is not connected to the business, but the instruction designer is responsible for keeping the course up to date. The course describes a business situation and that will change over time. Sometimes the course is even outdated when it's being published, but if you don't update it, it will be outdated within weeks, if not, um, um, or maybe months, but in a very short period. And because the disconnect between the instruction designer and the business development, all e-learning content will be outdated in no time. So basically that led us to the conclusion that uh, we spend a lot of time and money teaching people outdated content. And that is what we don't like and that is what we want to solve at DC Generator. So what we did is something very simple. We created the idea of employee generated learning, the third category. And then the key thing there is that the subject expert, the employee creates the content. And that is necessary because they are the only ones that can do that from a business perspective. And we found it is way faster and way cheaper to do it that way. So up to some five to 10 times faster and cheaper. So it's faster and cheaper. But more importantly, once the course is being published, they are, if they are responsible for the course, they are aware of changes in the business. So they can go into the course, edit it, press update, and the course is still live. So making a supplementary expert or a group of supplementary experts responsible for training material and e-learning courses is the only way to do it faster, cheaper, and make content that actually lives, that, is, that can be maintained. And is there no role at all for the instructor designer? That's not true, there is. They can do anything they want. So they can initiate a course. They can help design a course. They can even co-author a course. They can coach a support expert. They can do whatever they want, as long as they don't take over the responsibility for the creation and the maintenance. That is the key thing of employee generated learning. So, and with that, we see that employee generated learning has the most value. If you look at this, at this graph, it is a long tail of needs. So basically on the left, you see courses with a huge uh, uh, internal demand. For example, if you look at compliance training, security training, everybody in your organization has to take that. And those courses that are in the, on, the, on the left side of this graph um, usually are created top down by learning and development. So, but the more that you go to the right, which you see happening more and more in the business is that uh, a smaller group of employees actually need a certain training. So there is a, a specific pocket of people in a country or specific specialists that want a certain training. And that is just also too small for m and to create. And there is where employee generated learning comes in. So the, the whole right part of this graph is where employee generated learning really thrives. 
And here in the slide, it says uh, it can take up to 60 to 70 percent of the total learning needs in an organization. We'll look at an example of the known. They actually claim it's 95 percent of their content is being created by employees. So that is a really, really uh, a, a important uh, shift. So this long tail needs to tell you that courses that are like have a huge impact on everybody, really strategic courses taken by all the employees, they still should be top down learning uh, LD generated. You also have to track and trace that uh, because uh, you can be audited on that, things like that. But the more the, the smaller the amount of learners comes, the better uh, uh, it is to move to an LD generated learning approach. So if we summarize those arguments, we see that online training saves 40 to 60% over training from Brendan Hall comes that number. As I said, so one hour of e-learning costs approximately between uh, 10 dollars and $30,000. I rounded it up. So, and that's because it will cost between 80 and 240 hours, depending on the cost of the hours, you will get numbers like this. Maintenance of bespoke e-learning is almost impossible because there's a disconnect from the business. So a disconnect from the instructor designer that was responsible for the course with the business. And with an employee generated learning approach, you can extract a lot of value from those long tail requests. So those course, courses with smaller audiences. So that is sort of the stage that our customers are working on. And from there, um, you can see uh, that that will drive a lot of changes. So for LD, it's actually a huge change. So instead of just creating courses, um, they are now much more in guiding and coaching employees. So uh, uh, instruction design um, uh, knowledge in the LD department is still being used to coach the, the, uh, the separate experts to create better courses. So uh, they are involved in activating and engaging the separate experts. Uh, as I said, working together with them, coaching them, mentoring them, helping design it. And it will free up time for them to spend more time on strategic projects. So in the end, this can be a huge shift for instruction designers and L&D. But if you look at it, you can create a much more impactful role because you, with your knowledge, you can steer way more people and have impact on way more courses and you free up time to work on strategic projects at the same time. So uh, I want to take a dive into three business cases for employee generated learning, Danone, BHP and T-Mobile. So the known is the first one, and they actually uh, using Easy Generator to um, uh, uh, learn at the speed of the business. And they do that by really embracing a knowledge sharing culture. So uh, on the screen, you see Fred, uh, Frederick. Uh, uh, he is the head of digital learning, and he is really driving it forward. And what they achieved at the known is quite incredible in a relatively short time. They now empower a thousand employees to create learning content, and that saves them a lot of time and a lot of money. And uh, also, by the way, it gives them better uh, content that is better maintainable. So with the known, it's a really big success story. And there's a really interesting thing there. So Fred has a technical background. So and if you look at what he is building, that is an architecture that we see happening a lot. So on the left, you see the HR department and the line up to the 5% instruction design authoring tools following the LMS. That is sort of the normal path of all schools e-learning development. So initiated by HR and instruction design, it creates with a complex instruction design authoring tool content and publish that in an LMS. In their case, that is a cornerstone. Um, and Fred claims that this content will be only like 5% of the total learning content at most. Then there's another flow where subliminal experts create content. So sometimes initiated by LD, they ask uh, subliminal experts to create content, sometimes initiated by uh, SMEs themselves, and that is being published. Sometimes in the LMS, if it's uh, like a formal course, which is part of that 5%, but mostly it's published in an LXP. And for those who do not know the difference between an LMS and LXP, an LMS is like a TV. So it is pre-programmed, so you have to follow the program of the broadcast. So where you follow uh, on the TV, you have uh, news at 8, a soap at 8.20, and sports at 9. And you have to follow that. You can't change that. With an LMS, it's the same. The LED department determines for you which course you have to take and when you have to take them. Well, the LXP is much more like Netflix. So it's basically the same content, sometimes in a bit smaller chunks. 
but it's the same content, learning content. The difference is it's not pushed to you. It's just waiting there like it is with Netflix. So if you go to Netflix, you can just search for a series, you can search for a movie and start it whenever you want and even on which device that you want. So with learning, it's the same. And the content created with user generator, it's like a perfect marriage with an LXP, a learning experience platform. So let's call it the Netflix of learning. So the information is pushed there, uh, put there, and is waiting until there's a learning need with the learner, and the learner takes initiative to go in and pull that information out. So uh, for the known, by the way, that learning experience platform is, is at cost. There are a whole bunch of them out there. But we now see a, a difference of formal learning happening more and more in LMS and being limited to the LMS and the vast majority of the content being published to an LXP, the Netflix of learning. By the way, the LRS that you see in the middle stands for Learning Record Store, because learning now takes place in different places. If you want to track and trace it, you can't track and trace it inside your LMS, like most organizations do through SCORM. We have a new standard almost now for nine years. It's called XAPI. It's the new generation of SCORM, and that is able to track and trace from anywhere. That's the key thing of, of uh, XAPI. So it can track and trace from a course in the LMS, it can track and trace from HP, or even if you publish an easy generator course, you can publish through email or Slack or Teams or whatever you want. It can still track and trace that. And then you need a place where that is stored, and that is a learning record store, which is the LRS, which stands in between. So that's basically the result database. So an LMS for top-down learning, an LRS for the results, and LSP for the bottom-up learning. But the bottom-up learning at the node is something like 95% of the total. Moving to the second one, uh, BHP. So um, when they started, the risk team was the, the one that started with Easy Generator, and they actually saved $250,000 um, with Easy Generator. They were used in creating content. And by the way, that was only in the first year. Um, and uh, they were used to create content for part with instruction designers, but also for large part with external vendors. And uh, initially, they, they, they started looking at Easy Generator because their issue was it was too slow uh, to, to, to create that. So the whole process of going to the external vendor, them interviewing the people in the business, and that whole process was even slower than working with their own instruction designers. So that was the trigger. But then they started working with Easy Generator. They found that next that it is way faster. Uh, it's also way cheaper because now their learning manager Rob tells us that um, they spent less than hundred thousand dollars in a year to do all their content. And in the old days, if they were making a big security course, that was the amount of money that it was spent on just one course from one hour. So uh, because it's way more than the 30,000 as we just mentioned, but very often in this amount, it's also maintenance is taking place and something changes. So you need to go back and need to reactivate and the whole thing needs to start over again. So that's the amount that they mentioned to us that the old courses could cost up to $100,000. And that is now the budget for all the learning content at the at the at the, the risk uh, culture and capability department, it's now less than a hundred thousand a year. So that is like a huge shift and, and a huge saving of money, and it's way faster, and you can keep it up to date. And then the third one is T-Mobile. So they are using Easy Generator for a while now, and for them it was really about constraining resources. At the time they started using Easy Generator, they were a bit in trouble. It was T-Mobile in the Netherlands that started working with Easy Generator. And they were sort of the third uh, uh, party in the market and not really catching up with the first two. So they were really in trouble. So they don't, they didn't have a lot of money. And they found out that with Easy Generator, they can create content way, way faster. So actually, they, they claim that they can create five times more training output with only 25% of the resources. So with a quarter of the L&D team, they now create five times as much learning content, which is really, really awesome. And uh, the guy on the screen is Dennis, who's responsible at uh, T-Mobile for this. And he also claims that training is created 10 times faster than in the old process with the whole L&D uh, instruction design approach. And now, by the way, T-Mobile in the Netherlands is doing way better because uh, they got a huge investment. They bought a couple of other parties, so, uh, but uh, uh, it is still growing. So it is no longer only driven by cost and capacity and, 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 and money, they also uh, see that it's the way better way to create content and the quality of the content is really, really good. So they can now create five times more content with only 25% of the resources and they claim it's 10 times faster. So that is really impressive. 
So if we put that whole thing in the, the, the bigger scheme of things where we see things happening, then uh, as Jan Case already mentioned in this uh, uh, overview, the quadrant that we created in the learning diagram, we see things happening from formal learning towards knowledge transfer, but also, and that is also, for example, happening with all the three examples I gave, moving to performance support. So where you have learning here, you have like micro learning or workplace learning there. And that is a huge trend. So we see things happening from top down, uh, like the 5% from the known, and 95% of the, of the learning content is, is below the line. And um, also, um, if you talk to the learning managers like Fred, they will claim there's a lot of what they call hidden learning. So learning which is not, or shadow learning sometimes called, learning which is not happening in the le learning department or via the learning department or in the learning tools, it's just happening in the organization and they don't have any side of that. And all of that learning is in the bottom half of this. Uh, this uh, so all of that is bottom-up learning. So a summary is so, uh, for that, I hand over to uh, Jan Kees again. Yeah, thank you. I will start uh, my video again. Yeah, thank you, Casper, uh, uh, for the um, uh, great presentation and the uh, also the business cases of three uh, companies. So our summary, how can you recover from a recession and engage your CFO? Uh, we have seen some scenarios in recovery of a recession, and we have also looked at the experiences of um, recent recessions uh, during the financial crisis of 2008-2009, but also uh, more recently the recovery of the uh, pandemic. Um, that, um, sorry, sorry. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's stay here. Um, we talked about uh, ways on how to engage your CFO. Uh, we um, uh, addressed why employee-generated learning specifically is a very valuable uh, type of learning, and it's not um, a replacement of formal learning, but especially during these times, very interesting as a concept, even more compelling than ever. And we learned also what customers gained specifically from adopting and generated learning. Thanks. So yeah, let's go to the um, questions and answers. And yeah, of course, start engaging your CFO. And we have created a checklist uh, that can be shared after the presentation uh, that helps you uh, going through some of the, uh, the builds of a business case. Yeah, the checklist uh, Molly okay. put in the chat, so you can click that if you want to download that. So there's a question okay, about uh, connected to that young case. We don't have a lot of time, by the way, uh, so we need to go quickly. Uh, but the question is, you mentioned uh, earlier uh, that uh, in order to convince your CFO, uh, uh, there's a way better business case of organizations investing in learning in the 2008 to the research than afterwards. And two people were uh, wondering, is there a data source for that that they can actually show to their C-level uh, with that, uh, the proof, uh, and is that something that we can share? Yeah, let's let's we will share uh, because I, I we mentioned different uh, points. I, I some of the resources I mentioned in presentation, but I think we will make a full comprehensive uh, source and maybe add a few others as well because there's actually a lot of um, also um, uh, during the pandemic new sources created and content. So we will add some links that you can see uh, that have some um, actually compelling business cases and information, including also the sources of the information that we used. Yeah. Okay. We will send that to all the participants. Okay, perfect. Then a question from Sima, what CEO wants? My guess is it would differ from a product company to a service-based company and also the domains demands in the market because simply there are ROIs uh, sources are different. Uh, is that correct? And is it subject to, to a market risk? So different kind of companies, they will have like, different needs there for the CEO yes. oh. level? Yes, of course. Every company and also production first services is different, but um, the basics of um, demographics in the labor market that we see shorter uh, life cycles of, uh, of employees 
and that we see knowledge is becoming more and more important and also relatively more expensive because shorter life cycles. So it still takes time to train people and to there's a lot of new information and new technology, albeit in services, but also in production cases where there is new software of the updates or new machines in producing. You see that knowledge is has become more volatile than ever before. And that is both for services as well as most production companies as well. Even the traditional markets, if even a, a producing a car nowadays is like a, 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 the labor force on a car is more and more a computer savvy uh, labor force and also maintenance of the car is more and more computer savvy. So your typical maintenance of a even a um, an, an old fashioned uh, combustion engine car, uh, it, there is a lot of technology and software. A maintenance person becomes more and more not only changing the oil but more as a software person. So also in soft in production, you see that knowledge has become more and more volatile. That people have in the organizations, a lot of knowledge that is there to be captured and to be transferred. And in both cases, there's a compelling case, a compelling case for employee generated learning compared to the old fashioned way of top, uh, top down uh, learning. So I would argue, yes, there's a lot of uh, differences between that, but the basic idea on why employee generated learning in the context of the 21st century works better than before is valid for both. Okay, thank you. There's one uh, simple question that I will answer. The, somebody missed the explanation for the LRS, which was the learning record store. So it's a database for the results, whether training is done in a learning management system or LSP. So one database where all results are tracked. So we are also at our time. I see that Nelson already joined us. So we will take a four minute break and at the top of the hour, we will uh, restart and then continue with the, the last presentation of the day from Nelson. I used to work at Nielsen um, leading learning and development there. And as part of that role, as Casper said, one of the things I was responsible for was the rollout of employee generated learning. Um, probably about seven years ago now, I think something like that. Um, and at that time, Nielsen was going through a transition where we needed to, um, we were having customers costs cut back and the team scaled back um, and we needed to be able to produce more learning than ever before and we needed to find a way to do more with less so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, in today's session. I left Nielsen about four years ago um, and set up a learning and development consultancy called Willow and Puddyfoot um, so as well as partnering with Easy Generator now as an enablement consultant for employee generated learning we also deliver other um, learning and development products and services, things like management development, leadership development, other professional skills development. So really um, working with lots of different organizations, getting exposure to lots of different learning and development needs from all sorts of directions. So I like to think that I keep my learning and development expertise up to date, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have two questions before we kick off your presentation. The first one was obvious that you're, you're English. And yeah, I, I do love your, your last name. Is, is there a story connected to the name explaining? <laughs> well, I have to give my husband credit for my name because I married the name it. rather than was born with it. Um, so yes, it is an English name. It originates from kind of central England, Hertfordshire area. Um, and actually in old English, it means barrel stomach. Um, and I think it's like a pudding stomach that you can't see your feet. So the actual meaning of the name is actually not particularly flattering, um, but I do like it. I was quite happy to take it on when I got married. I think it's a really cool name. Uh, I also have another question. So you work with a lot of organizations, larger business, smaller business. Is there uh, uh, also in different countries, uh, is there one specific topic that keeps popping up all the time? It's like one central team right now with learning and development at a sort of top of mind. Or is it really diverse? I think it's quite diverse. I think what is consistent is that I think the rate of change is forever increasing and the need for more, 
unique or business specific learning just increases. So that need for employee generated learning is kind of growing all the time as businesses are evolving more and more quickly. Um, and a lot of the business we businesses we work with are expanding, so increasing what they do and taking on new people um, quickly. So we definitely see that need evolve. I think from a broader perspective, we see lots of kind of common topics around how people work together and the relationship side of work as well. So um, how to have good conversations, give each other feedback, work well as a team together, that kind of thing. Um, and, and growing into kind of resilience and mental health as well as that becomes kind of important, fundamental in different organizations that we work with. Okay, thank you. So um, last thing from my side. So if you have any questions, feel free to either put them in the, in the chat or in the Q&A. So we'll pick them up at the end of uh, Louise's presentation. So Louise, the floor is yours, go ahead. Thank you, I'm just sharing my screen. Sorry, just a moment, should be able to see that now. Okay, yeah? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. So I want to talk today about doing more with yes, be less, because I think we've seen, haven't we, a number of years of transformation since the whole COVID pandemic started, as we've been faced with more and more challenges along the way. Um, and that really continues now as we're faced with increased economic pressure, um, we see businesses rethinking their strategies and we see that as a result of that organizations learning needs are growing but their budgets now may sometimes be more limited so we need to think about how we as learning and development can do more with less and thrive during this difficult time and we know that sometimes economic pressure as we're experiencing now can mean big changes for organizations it can mean sometimes that budgets are cut it can sometimes mean that headcount might decrease and sometimes learning and development can be one of the departments that comes under pressure in times like this um, and we know that um, many of us might already feel the pain that we wish we had more budget, we wish we had more time, we wish we had more people. Um, and when that's pushed even more, it can feel very challenging for us. And we also know that skill development is really important and that it's a big focus for many organisations going forward. So we're kind of asking ourselves that question around how we can do what we need to do. Um, meet those skill development needs with potentially less money or less resource. So before we get into the detail of the presentation today, we'd love um, to take a poll to get an idea from you in the audience what you're experiencing at the moment um, and ask you whether you're experiencing some of these things that I've talked about. Molly, are you able to share the poll? Yes, but I'm not sure your slides are moving. We're still on the first one. Yeah, that's Louise. okay. Okay, okay, perfect. Yep. Yeah, perfect. So I'm just launching the poll now. So we want to ask you, are you experiencing learning and development budget cuts? Are you experiencing the size of your learning and development team reducing? Um, and is the need for training in your organization increasing faster than the amount of learning and development resource available? So let us know by answering those questions. How are we doing, Molly? Yeah, good. Are you seeing the results as well, Louise? No, I can't see the results. Ah, okay, interesting. So I can uh, 
I can <laughs> share them as well. So thank you. Um, yeah, of course. So on the first one, are you experiencing L and D budget cuts? Um, we have fifty four percent of people that said yes. Forty six percent of people said no. Um, the second one is the size of your L and D team reducing. We had thirty nine percent of people say yes. Sixty one percent said no. And uh, is the need for training increasing faster than the amount of L&D resources available? 91% said yes and 9% uh, said no. So great. Uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Molly. And thank you everyone for sharing that. That's really interesting to see. Um, yeah, wow. So 91% of us seeing the need for training increasing faster than the amount of resource available. That's huge, isn't it? It's a, a, obviously a very common problem. And many of us also experiencing budget cuts um, and or the size of our teams reducing as well. So it's a very real challenge. And it was a very similar challenge, albeit a different time, that we experienced at Nielsen when we first started looking into the opportunities of working um, with employee generated learning. So I want to take you back to a little bit of the backstory in terms of what was happening in the organization when we decided to go down this route, this route. So the background for Nielsen was that we'd grown by acquisition over many years and the organization was made up of many different business units, sometimes providing training for their own people in their own way. And so we decided to go through a consolidation exercise where we're bringing those disparate teams together to form one centralized global team. And there's obviously benefits to that. You know, you get economies of scale, you're not duplicating effort with multiple teams doing the same thing. Um, you get more consistency in that you have one approach that you can use to go out to the whole organization and you can potentially get cost savings as well. And what that meant for us actually was that we did reduce the size or reduce the number of learning and development people in the organization overall um, when we made that central learning and development team. Um, and that meant that there was really a reduction um, effectively in learning and development people or resource available. Um, so we needed to think about how we were going to best apply the team that we had. Um, and we um, really focus that central learning and development team on the key business strategic priorities. Um, so that would be the big priorities that would tend to impact the business at a global level, impact large numbers of people in the business. Um, and that would be where that central team was focused. The gap that that left was really the more business unit or department specific training, which was really about the specific um, tasks that were happening um, or processes that were happening um, in each of the different business units and how would we meet that training need um, and that was where we really needed to be able to to meet that need in a new and different way alongside that we'd, we'd also seen reductions in spend across the organization the organization was making its own cuts um, and so that we knew that the budget for vendors for learning and development was also reduced so we needed to bring in some of those projects that would have previously gone to vendors in-house and find a way to do that too. Um, and it just wasn't physically possible for um, the central learning and development team to take on all of the training needs in the organization where um, if that were the case, um, we would have had a long, long queue for training that we could never have realized. Um, and even things like updates to existing courses and stuff, um, we'd start to form a bottleneck because we would have a queuing system in place where people couldn't get updates quickly. And then that makes it really hard to keep information fresh and keep information current. Um, so we decided to look at um, employee generated learning as a way to enable us to be able to meet those needs, to, to get that departmental, um, that employee specific, business unit specific learning in place, working with our experts in the business. Um, and so that we could do that in a, in a really good um, and really effective and efficient way. So what we found um, was that there are a number of benefits of going down that route once we looked into it. So I wanna talk you through these four benefits that we experience today. 
Um, so it firstly enabled us to really capture the expertise of our internal experts. Um, we were really able to make sure that we could get that expertise and capture it and document it and have it available to share with lots of other people in the organization. It also meant quality for us in terms of having the experts involved, so um, very accurate training um, and then being able to keep it up to date effectively and quickly. It meant that we could limit that skill gap, so whether that's new people coming into the organisation or new processes and tools in place, we could upskill people quickly in the organisation. Um, and then finally, we could reduce our dependency on external suppliers and external vendors as we built this expertise of doing things in house. So I'm going to go into all four of those benefits in a little bit more detail for you now. So if we start with capturing expertise and enabling our employees to produce effective learning. When we empower all of our people to produce learning, that enables us to increase our output um, in terms of learning um, without increasing our costs, because we can capture that internal expertise and experience. By capturing that, we also have longer term benefits because we ensure that critical business knowledge and experience is shared and retained even when people leave. So, you know, we've gone heard a lot about the great resignation recently, um, still have, you know, churn in organisations when we have people leave, we want to make sure we have that knowledge captured on an ongoing basis so we're not left with a gap when people leave. And we have to bear in mind that our subject matter experts that we're working with are exactly that. They're experts in their subject matter. They're content experts. They're not learning designers. So we won't expect them to build training in the same way as we would an instructional designer or a learning designer. And we're really asking them to share their expertise. So we need the right tools and right support in place for them to be able to turn their expertise into effective learning in a really user friendly and simple way. Um, and so in the research we did of different tools available, we found that Easy Generator was a really simple to use tool that enabled um, our subject matter experts to turn their expertise into learning um, easily and, and in a straightforward way. We also found a benefit of quality and accuracy. And so quality is an interesting one. We often also hear the pushback of, but the quality won't be good enough because these people aren't learning designers or instructional designers. So it kind of depends what we mean by quality. So when we're asking our subject matter, expertise, subject matter experts to design learning, we're not having the same expectations in terms of design expertise or quality that we might, um, from instructional designers. What we're asking them for is a way of sharing their knowledge in a really clear way. Um, and what that means we do get in terms of quality is um, courses created that are really relevant to the business and the business needs because it comes from the people in the business themselves. It's also um, high quality and high accuracy because it's constantly updated by those subject matter experts themselves. They don't need to come to the learning and development team and wait in a queue for somebody to work with to make updates. They can do it simply and easily in a matter of hours or minutes. Um, they don't need to go to external vendors or anything like that. Another great benefit is the fact that you can collaborate on courses together. So it means that you can have multiple experts working together on a course um, and that, you know, then brings more expertise together into one place. Again, um, because we're asking people to do this and we're asking people to come together, we needed to think about um, what are the processes and technologies that we use to do this. So again, you know, obviously we're using e Easy Generator is our tool. We also thought about the bigger processes in place around, um, you know, how does someone get a license? Where do they go to find out information? Then they use the tool when they've built the e-learning. 
how do they publish it, um, all that kind of thing as well. We wanted to make sure that whole end-to-end -end process of somebody building an e-learning was really as simple and as user-friendly as possible, which certainly in our case, it hadn't previously been. So we really simplified that part of the process as well. The third benefit that I mentioned was around filling the skill gaps. So we know we've seen a lot of churn recently. We know we've got people leaving businesses in some cases at historic rates, and we don't want to have that critical business knowledge being lost when people leave. Um, and we expect that to continue, particularly if you're having headcount costs in your organization, you can um, expect that continue even more. Um, so we want to make sure we're always capturing people's knowledge. As things change as well, we tend to see um, people move roles. We tend to see new processes come into place, new ways of doing things. So we want to make sure we can meet those learning needs created by that change, whether it's um, being able to skill somebody up who's picking up a role that somebody's moved on from, or whether it's just something new that's been launched into the organization and we need to get people up to sp speed with it quickly. And so we find at times of, of change or times of um, gaps that the learning need increases and that the need for, for more learning output increases as we have those growing training needs. So we need to be ready to meet those needs and we need to have the right tools and processes in place to be able to do that. And then the final benefit that I want to mention today was our reduction on de dependency on external suppliers or external vendors. Um, so we would have had, you know, reasonable sized budget um, going to external vendors and when budgets were cut, they were one of the things that we really needed to think about um, and bringing more learning production in-house definitely considerably reduces the need for that budget. It means that less money is spent with more expensive external agencies or even freelancers and contractors um, and that we can and do things ourselves. Um, and although some of that external work can be high quality from a design perspective, it can also be a long um, and an expensive process to create and maintain um, courses that are delivered externally. Whereas when you do things in house, um, it can be much quicker to be able to get things up and running quicker to deploy them. Um, so that can be really useful when you want to get people up to speed quickly. And then of course, it really gives you the opportunity to be really well aligned with those specific business needs that you have in the organization and work at speed and at scale to produce impactful learning experiences. So to summarize, we saw lots of benefits of going down the um, employee generated learning route. We definitely found we could increase the volume of learning we, we were producing whilst um, doing so with high quality and high speed um, and less overall spend to do so. So it was really a great win for us in the organization. Um, and even though I left Nielsen some time ago, some years ago myself, they've continued to work with Easy Generator um, throughout those years um, as a key tool for how, um, how they enable employee generated learning in the organization. So any questions you have around the benefits that we saw or how we did that, I'll be happy to discuss. Yes, so feel free to add any questions to uh, the Q&A that is in uh, the tool. So we have uh, a question there from Rebecca. So how do you counter the argument we often hear of, uh, while this may reduce reliance on external suppliers, won't this be wasting critical internal time or be a barrier to output for internal staff? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I think it depends how well that process works with external suppliers and what you're using the training for. But certainly 
in our experience, working with external suppliers was quite time consuming in itself. Um, so even though they were doing the heavy lifting in terms of the course design, there was typically quite a heavy amount of time needed from a subject matter expert perspective to provide them with information to use to build the course, to provide feedback to, to build the course, particularly if it's something that's specific to your business or your department. So that designer um, or external agency won't have any expertise in the topic. Um, so that means that um, you save that back and forth time of working with a vendor and just build it yourself. Um, the other saving we found is that we often had people that were kind of go to people for training who would end up repeating the same thing many times for many different people. So, um, you know, if you're the expert in a certain process, you might end up training every new person who comes into the team on that process, dealing with every question people have about that process. Once you've put your expertise into an e-learning, you then can use that e-learning to do a large proportion of that in-person stuff that you would have been doing before. So it is a bit of a kind of short-term pain now to invest your time in creating the e-learning, um, but long-term gain later when you save back all that time of that continuous kind of one-to-one -one conversation that you'd have. Yeah. Pay now, save later. Yeah, that's clear. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, a question from Frederick, I think. Uh, how do you motivate employees to share knowledge? How to overcome the fear of the spotlight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, in terms of overcoming the fear of the spotlight, one of the um, learnings we had actually was when we first started out, we decided to be quite hands off as a central L&D team. So, you know, this is employee generated learning. We'll give them all the tools. We're, we're not going to hold their hand. We're not going to be heavily involved. Um, and actually, we had to rethink that and, and change that approach, particularly for people publishing their first learning. And we found that some of it was just a kind of confidence thing that is particularly if you've not done that before. It's quite daunting, isn't it, to publish your first learning if you feel like no one else has looked at it. So we did find sometimes with new people, we um, we would actually kind of give them that reassurance. Yep, this is good. Yep, let's press go um, to help them overcome that fear of the spotlight. Okay. We did a lot of out slowly. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we did a lot of that ourselves initially um, back in, you know, many years ago, but actually Easy Generator help a lot with that as well. And they have um, people available to kind of look at things as well. So that can be really useful. Yeah, and the counterweight of it is, of course, that uh, if you do it, you are recognized as an expert on a certain field. So that sort of balances it out uh, a bit. Exactly. Okay. That, I think that answers Frederico's motivate. Um, how do you motivate people a bit? Because by sharing your knowledge, you do get that recognition as an expert. Um, so that's one way that you can motivate people. Some people are also quite intrinsically motivated to want to help people learn and enjoy it. So that's also helpful. Okay. So I see questions popping in in the chat and in the Q&A. So preferably use the Q&A. That's easiest for me to follow. Uh, I will work both if possible. <laughs> well, we have a question from Joyce. Uh, what were the greatest challenges and resistance to change from management uh, and employees with the rollout of uh, EGL? So the biggest resistance from both management and employees for EGL. Yeah. Um, I think the one that's been kind of mentioned in the questions actually of you know these people are busy they don't have time for this we can't be giving them something else to do was a fairly commonplace uh pushback from management some management not all but different people understood things differently so we would need to be prepared to explain the benefits of them doing it and kind of what the benefits would be for that person potentially to save time as i've just mentioned or for the team overall to have this in place, how is that going to benefit the team? How is the time commitment that they're going to give going to be worth it? Um, and from people themselves, again, probably time is the biggest factor. And it's true, isn't it? I mean, everyone is really busy. We know everyone's really busy. No one's suggesting that people are sat with a couple of hours spare every day that they can build some e-learnings. So it's really about thinking about what are the benefits you know when you invest this time what do you get back why are you doing this why is this worth it and and how to make that work okay so that's directly related to the question from marianne uh, how do you sell the benefits to subject specialists to take the time and create content for others they already know what they're doing so what's in it for them 
Yeah. Any additional debt? Mostly what's in it for them is not to be asked questions or to have their profile be raised as we've spoken about. Some people are, are more intrinsically motivated than others. So we we definitely took the approach that we would start working with the people that wanted to do it. So um, the keen people, the early adopters, whatever you want to call them, we embrace them and we and we work with them first before we try to challenge those people that were really resistant. So I think, you know, think about that. You don't necessarily have to get every challenging person on board from day one. You can start with people that are much more um, open minded to it or keen on it, show examples of success. And then when you start to see those examples of success, other people come on board as well. Yeah. It was also uh, a topic that came up in the previous conversation uh, presentation of Geert uh, on the hospital. And so it had also to do with letting go as a learning department. The moment that you're pushing things, then you need to convince people that they have to do it and have to do it to make time and on the right quality. If it's a need that comes from them, then that goes away. And for example, he was telling, uh, explaining that doctors had an interest in raising the quality of the care. And from that perspective, they were taking initiatives and then you do not have any to explain any benefits, whatever it is. They are solving their own problem, basically. So that's yeah. a really different perspective, I think. Yeah, great point. Yeah. OK, uh, did you use incentives to encourage engagement uh, contribution? Not really, not certainly not financial. Um, I guess we we would make our learners part of a community. They would get to talk to each other about how things were going. They'd probably increase their network. They would have their profile raised. So they didn't have direct incentives, but there were things that people liked about being an easy generator author. There were benefits that they experienced from that, that they enjoyed. Um, and we tried to make it a, you know, a pleasant and well-supported experience. And we thought a lot about how do we reward and recognize people just in terms of publishing case studies about things that they'd done, um, sharing successes in meetings, thanking them, simple things like that. Okay, yeah, clear. Yeah. So um, I, I actually uh, know of a customer, it's a, a, it's a life insurance company, and they actually, if you uh, create content, you can actually score points there. Uh, and they sort of, uh, and by the way, the points only uh, count if actually people use your content. So just publishing isn't enough. And then mm -hmm. those points are taken into account in your yearly evaluation. So it's sort of you know, that way it has an input on your salary. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. And another example maybe is a sort of uh, uh, managing by example. So I think that uh, also having, uh, so if you as a manager want to sort of have your people share knowledge, then uh, taking the, uh, the, the, the task for yourself to do that as an example is really beneficial. Show them uh, that it works and that you do it as well. Yeah, that's a great point. I think uh, maybe we just lost Casper oh. for a second. So. <laughs> Okay, I can uh, I can pick up the the Q and A just uh, till we get Casper back. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm just going through which ones we have not answered yet. Um, we have one from Matt that asks, "What specific KPI slash metrics um, do you look at to determine a successful course uh, or training content?" Hmm. So the first thing I'd look at, not it's not really a KPI, is just does it give people they know, the knowledge they need to do their jobs? So we would look at things as what do people need to do their jobs? What do they need to know? Does this course give them what they need to do their jobs? Does it give them what they need to know from a more informal perspective? From a formal perspective, we would we did gather data. So we did gather reach figures on how many e-learnings have been created, how many people taken them. We had surveys built into our LMS so we could get some feedback on whether people like them. For some projects, we would do more um, to look at the actual business impact of a specific project if it had a really clear goal. Um, so we'd measure that as well. Um, so we did have those kind of KPIs, but I think fundamentally, if you're just looking at one e-learning at a time, it's does it give people what they need to do their jobs is the question. 
yeah definitely welcome back casper yeah, sure. hi casper <laughs> we missed you something happened to my internet connection not sure what happened but uh, i dropped suddenly so i got the last part of your of your answer by the way we have also have a feature in user generator to sort of uh, evaluate the quality of the content how people like it so uh, it is called the nps score basically uh, at the end of a course you can ask a question to the learner uh, would you recommend this course to somebody else and based on that uh, the course gets a score and you actually can see as a as an author how well uh, you are doing also we have what we call data insight in this generator so um, for a certain expert, it's not that interesting to see uh, that Louise has scored an, an eight for my course or not, but it is really interesting to see how many people took my course, how long did they uh, in general take about it, did they finish it, uh, did the questions work out or not. So we are using the data that we gather to sort of inform them on that, and that is also really satisfying for them. Okay, I'm looking at the Q&A section, and maybe Molly, you can help me out, maybe it's empty. Yeah. My internet went down, but I think we answered all the questions. Yeah, so there are a few more in the chat as well um, that have just come up. So, um, yeah, one of them, uh, another one from Federico is, can employee-generated learning go hand-in-hand -hand with uh, task delegation? Uh, this was, I mean, as a team manager, putting your team uh, to employee-generated learning, are there any experiences that you know of? Okay. So, one way I know it works well is... Um, if you are the manager of a team and there are some processes, let's say, in your team that are not documented and maybe you're having to repeatedly train people on them or somebody else is, one thing you can do is delegate the task of creating a learning on that to somebody that you're training in that process. So um, when you're training them, part of their learning experience is going to be taking what you're teaching them and putting it into Easy Generator so that then that can be shared with other teammates in the future. And there's great benefits to that. It takes that workload off your plate. Um, it means you get something created that can then be shared for everyone else. It's, it's formalized, it's documented, it's a better process. Um, and it also for their own development is really beneficial because a great way for them to remember what they've learned um, from that task is to then have to document it and repeat it to somebody else. Okay, nice. I think we got another one in the Q&A as well, Casper. Yeah, I see. Uh, could you share the three key tasks that the SME will need to manage? Hmm. Um, so I think when an SME is creating training, I see it as kind of two things they need to think about. One of them is what what content do I want to share and how do I want to share that? And then the other bit is how do you put that in the tool? So actually the first bit's harder, like turning your content, um, putting your content into the easy generator tool, it's very easy to use. Actually, that's kind of the easy bit, although there'll be a little bit of a learning curve when they first use it, it's, it's not difficult. Um, kind of in the same way I guess as structuring a PowerPoint present presentation using PowerPoint itself isn't that difficult or Google Slides or whatever isn't that difficult but actually thinking about okay what's the message what are the how do I want to structure this what are the what's the breakdown of content is the bit that probably needs the thought so I think as a SME the kind of steps are you know understanding what do people need to learn then thinking about okay how am I going to structure that content to make it understandable in a simple way for people and then the third bit is put it in the tool and, and build it okay clear then uh, we have two other questions uh, so what was or were the biggest challenges when getting SMEs to create their own content hmm I think I think we've answered that a little bit around, you know, time and how to go about it. I think one of the other things we found helpful with those challenges was sharing best practices. So what I guess the challenge is they don't know where to start or they don't know what good looks like. So what we want to do is show them what a good employee generated learning looks like. And particularly if it's something that's already been done in your organization, then it feels really relevant to them. It's not just, you know, easy generator, have some great examples you can share, but I think it takes it to another level when you have something created in your organization. So when they see that their peer over there 
has created this and it's really nice and it looks like this, they get the kind of idea of, oh, okay, I'm going to create one like that. So we would find that people would essentially copy each other, but I mean that in a good way, that they take inspiration from something that was already done and then think I'm going to build something like that. So we found that helpful to kind of mitigate that challenge. Yeah. I also remember from the early days with Nielsen that we were working, I think you had a guy in Australia who was really active and he found yeah. out that they had had like a peer in Sweden that he completely didn't know, but that was sort of working on the same thing as he was. And they found it out because they were creating the same courses. So that way it was also sort of uh, uh, being able to connect them together and that they sort of teamed up. I, I remember that and we see that happening more often indeed. Yeah, that's great. That's so true. David in Australia. Yeah, yeah we, um, yeah, we, um, and we did. So w when people would, um, when somebody was about to create an e-learning, one of the things that we would guide them to do would be to search the existing system to see if something already existed or was in creation. So that would mean that they would have that, get that visibility as to somebody else who might be doing yeah. something similar to them. Correct. Um, the last question also is something that maybe was already touched on, uh, how, um, oh, there's another question popping up, so <laughs> after that, uh, but if training were first created bottom-up, how did you, if any way, recognize, award those who took the effort, or was it seen as something they should have done in the first place? So we talked a bit about um, doing that. So maybe I can yeah. share something that we do, a best practice is a generator that I think is one of the coolest things that we do in our company. So we use Slack, which is something similar like Teams. And in Slack, you can create a channel on a certain topic. And we have a, what we call a recognition channel. So there you can give praise to somebody if somebody does really, something really good. So it's connected to our values. We have four values. And for each value, we created a whole bunch of, of, of cards. And what you actually can do, you can drag in a card into the channel. And for example, I could uh, after this webinar, I could we have one of our values is, for example, we deliver. And I could actually then uh, uh, tag Molly in that post. Hey, well, Molly, for the first time with an event, you organized it really great and let other people know that we did that. Show uh, how we sort of uh, do that value, but at the same time, giving her praise and recognition. So those kind of things can be really cool to do. And I think it's one of the coolest things we do at this generator in, in, in recognizing people in their effort. So it doesn't have to be money, just being awarded with uh, that somebody actually noticed that what you did and, and, and gives you praise is already a great thing. Do you have anything to add to, to that from a, a rewarding perspective for people who create content? It sounds great what you just described and I would just agree we'd always want to recognize and reward as much as possible so we'd never take the attitude they should have been doing it anyway we'd always want to thank people at the very least and where we see great examples celebrate them raise you know raise awareness of what they've done. Yeah, great. So don't do the last thing. So don't take them for granted. They should have done it anyway, even if that is the case. If they do a great job, still give them praise. Indeed, I agree with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay, then we have a question from Heidi. By the way, Heidi Nielsen, that is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how would a learner use EG as a knowledge base? Not sure how to find a topic in the middle of a course or how to... It was mentioned in the first session to use it like uh, we use Google. So learner can word search all course or have to look at agenda for each course. So that's maybe directed to me a bit more because I did the first question. Um, so yeah, uh, very good question. So if you have, uh, so Easy Generator is really to capture the knowledge. And we're more looking at learning management systems and learning experience platform to make it available. And what we see happening now is that more and more tools, and some of the are the really big tools like Cornerstone, but also the last speaker of the day will be Nelson uh, from uh, How Now, which is an LXP. And they integrate with your existing tools. Uh, so you actually, they have an integration with Slack, they have an integration with Teams, they even have an integration with Google. So, and it's so cool because if you just type in a search in, 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 in your browser in Google, so how do I do this or how do I do that? Then there is a small bar on the right of your screen that actually will show the results, not from Google, but the results from uh, the, the, the LXP from the database. And that is content created by your peers. So that way you make it available. So it is not easy generator that sort of makes it available. We sort of do the, the capturing, the altering part. And we sort of uh, look at other uh, tools like LMSs, LXPs, uh, knowledge management system, performance support tools to sort of pull that information in and make it available at the moment of need. Do you have anything to add to that, Louise? No, I don't actually. We 
back back in those days we didn't have that functionality but i know that now that organization um does have an lxp and does operate in a similar way that you described yeah yeah and, and what we see happening is with uh, with the learning content so we from a learning department come up with okay we put this content in the learning management system and that content in lxp and this content will be in sharepoint and that content will be in our knowledge base and the, the learner is ignorant of that. And so what you need to have is like one search channel that search all those sources. So the learner can just go in one place and search and all that information will pop up. And what we see happening with easy generator content, it sort of populates all four of those uh, knowledge bases. And then the key thing is you need to have facility to find it back. Okay, I see another question from, uh, uh, let's see, uh, here it is. I need to, uh, oh, I need to leave the training. <laughs> <laughs> I need to read before I start reading it out loud. So I think that was the last question. Thank you. So we're exactly top of the hour. So let's start. So Perfect. Nelson, welcome. So uh, we don't know each other for long. So uh, we recently met. Uh, so you are the CEO of How Now. Uh, which is uh, a, a learning experience platform that is uh, partnering with Easy Generator. We're currently investigating how we can collaborate. And I have to say that uh, I saw a brief demonstration of the tool and I thought, oh, wait a minute, that is really cool. So I actually scheduled the second uh, more deep one. So it is a really cool tool. I can advise everybody to take a look at that. And I'm really happy to have you here because uh, uh, well, you're not only the CEO of, uh, of Hanau, you're also the author of, uh, of a book that you recently published. So, but maybe you want to uh, introduce yourself uh, first. Uh, yeah, firstly, look, thanks for having me and it's great to virtually meet you all. But as Casper said, um, I'm one of the founders and CEO at a company called How Now. Um, basically, some of the fastest growing companies in the world use us to onboard and upskill and support their people um, in a far more engaging way. So, you know, often you've got traditional systems that are designed to solve the admins problems and deliver compliance. But when it comes to actual upskilling and reskilling, that's often where the LMS fails. Um, and that's the problem we're trying to address. Um, and as you mentioned, Casper, um, back in June, um, I had a book come out called Learning at Speed, which is really kind of borrowing lessons, frameworks and mental models from the last 15 years of my life in entrepreneurship. Um, but what I learned was really actually there's a lot of stuff you can take from entrepreneurship and adapt it for the world of learning and development internally. And that's essentially what the book is about. Yeah. I also have a question on the book because, uh, uh, of course, the, the title is Learning at Speed. And if you open up the book, the first thing you will see uh, is a quote. I have it written down. So it's a quote from Eric Ries and it says, the only way to win is to learn faster and, uh, than anyone else and also learning at speed. So we're in a rush to learn. So can you just briefly explain why that quote and why that title? Yeah, so I guess learning at speed, often people um, mistake it for, you know, is it a way of increasing your reading time or watching time or, you know, listening to something on 2x, but it, it's less about that and more about how you can minimize the waste that's a part of the learning process and the L&D process and maximize value. So there's a lot of things right now um, in L&D we're probably doing that's not actually delivering value to our end customer, which is the employee. Um, and, you know, there's too much time spent on creating courses that actually drive no meaningful value. Then there's a whole bunch of different processes. So learning at speed is really about if we cut out all of those things that weren't adding value and double down on the things that were, you would essentially be able to get from A to B faster. And that's really what learning at speed is, is how do you identify uh, the things that matter um, and identify the things that don't and how can you constantly iterate in the direction of moving towards your outcome and that's really what learning at speed is but the reason for that quote is um you know that's essentially what eric rice who wrote the lean startup um was from the same world view of essentially when you're building a company very similar to um l d teams you've got very limited resources, limited capacity, and you've got to very quickly figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work before, from a startup's perspective, before you run out of money. Yeah. Um, and so it's important that you minimize the waste and maximize your learning um, as a lead to, to be a lean startup. And so I think it's a very fitting quote, not just for startups, but for any team within any organization, but in particular for learning and development teams. 
Okay, well, thank you for that explanation. So, and uh, you will actually talk about sustainable learning in times of change. Uh, so, it's about empowering employees to not only create, but also curate and promote content. So, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much. So, I'm just going to quickly um, share my screen and take it from there. Um, That's your screen. Great. Yeah, perfect. All right, I'll kick off. So I wanted to start with first a, a, a little story, kind of taking you back to 2020, where a 118-year-old Arcadia group um, collapsed into administration. Now, the Arcadia group was already struggling to keep up with newer brands that were entering the space with fast, slicker digital operations. But then COVID-19 happened. Now, if you haven't heard by now, it was unprecedented. So much so, it was unprecedented how many times the word unprecedented was used uh, before that time. But with the global pandemic, the Arcadia Group's cracks became chasms. And, and essentially, the pandemic put the final nail in the coffin of the retail giant. However, in the same year, a 20-year-old company called ASOS managed to quadruple its profits, add three million and new customers and actually ended up buying Topshop and Miss Selfridge brands from Sir Philip Green's Arcadia Group. Now, that is one story, but there are many that tell us one thing, which is we're now living in an era of exponential change where there are new winners and new losers that are being created at a remarkable speed. Why? Because at the current rate of accelerating change, we see new uncertainties and new um, opportunities. Now, the fastest learners will be able to seize and win those opportunities. However, those who can't learn fast enough will struggle to keep up, they'll struggle to compete, and eventually they'll lose. And so we often discuss around, you know, what would the future of work looks like? And, you know, is it going to include A? Is it going to include B? But there's one thing we could be certain about. The future of work will be all about learning at speed, because at the current rate of change, none of the traditional competitive advantages are sustainable. You know, back in the day, you could have a high quality product or cheap prices or better talent. And that was enough for you to be able to have a competitive advantage. However, at the current rate of change, that's not enough. The only sustainable competitive advantage for any company is your ability to be able to learn and apply what you learn at speed. Now, the problem is most organizations are struggling to learn effectively, let alone learn at speed. Now, why is that? It'll be great to know in the chat how many of you have played bingo, but essentially, the way many organizations tend to approach learning and development in their organization is much like a game of bingo. Now, for those of you who've never played bingo, it's where I would call out a number. If you had that number on your bingo card, you've now won, right? When you've got the winning matching numbers. Now, why is L&D very similar in some organizations? Well, typically what happens is there's a top-down request for a particular training um, or learning content, then essentially L&D teams and instructional designers would go away and let's just say they spend the next six months creating a beautiful course with animations, workbooks, quizzes. And uh, there's been so many rounds of revisions and sign-offs that we've convinced ourselves that we've built the most perfect course in the world. And then at a time that we think is relevant as L&D people, we push this course out, but we don't actually know whether it's going to be relevant or whether it's the right time for the rest of the employee. Then we realize when we push it out, it's a bit like me calling out the number with bingo. I call out the number when I push out the course. Some people have the number. Great. That means they get value from the course. But most people don't have the number. And unfortunately, every time organizations play L&D bingo, most times they lose. And every time they're losing, they're wasting valuable time, resources, and money. And every time they lose at L&D Bingo, they're losing the, the employee's trust that 
LND can be a problem solver. And this often shapes how much um, employees engage with what LD teams offer. And it also affects how much budget you're able to get from the business. Now, is this a common problem? It's a very common problem. So much so, in 2020, globally, we spent more than the equivalent of 160 countries worth of GDP on training and learning. It's about 360 billion that was spent. But in the same year, when employees were surveyed about their L&D function, they found 75% of employees were dissatisfied with their company's L&D function. 12% of employees reported applying those new skills they learned from training on the job. And 60% of employees wouldn't even recommend their organization's L&D opportunities. Now, this is what we call the engagement gap. Engagement is the primary requirement for any learning to take place in your organization. It's not the only requirement, but it's the primary requirement. Because if people don't engage with what you're offering, everything else that follows, like behavior change, performance improvement, business impact, Everything that follows won't happen without engagement happening first. So in order for us to build a successful learning organization, we need to be able to close this engagement gap. Now, how can we close this? Well, what's happening right now is often year after year, organizations make the mistake of trying to close this engagement gap by investing in more content. What they believe is by having more quote unquote, interactive and fun content, they can close this engagement gap. However, what they're not thinking about is even by making it interactive and fun, when you don't think about the context, the relevance of the content, you're essentially pushing out the wrong content to the wrong person at the wrong time. Now, what we're going to talk about today in the rest of the session is how you can work with your employees to right those wrongs and connect the right content to the right people at the right time. So I'm gonna to touch on three things you can take away today and implement in your organization to close this engagement gap and move towards a successful learning organization. Now, the first one is how you can tap in to your collective intelligence. Now, one of the biggest risks company have is what we call the leaky bucket. Now, the leaky bucket is imagine someone who's been in your organization for the last five years. Whilst they've been at the organization, there's tons and tons of great stuff they've learned from the job. Now, when they leave that organization, all of that good stuff that is stored in their head leaves with them. And this is what we call the leaky bucket problem. Now, at the current rate of change, no organization can afford to relearn the things that they once knew. We have just enough time to learn the things we need to learn to keep up. So any organization that has a leaky bucket is falling further and further behind. And often the mistake we make in organizations is we look externally for expertise, but very often we overlook and don't tap into the internal expertise we have. Now, there's three steps for you to be able to do this. Step one is to reduce the friction for capturing this knowledge. What you don't want is a complex tool where you need your internal subject matter to essentially, uh, subject matter experts to upskill themselves and it's too complex for them to learn how to do it. It needs to be as easy as sharing a social post on LinkedIn. It needs to be as easy as me sending a message to my colleague on Slack or MS Teams. And there are multiple different ways of doing this using different tools. To give you examples of how our customers do it using HowNow, for example, we have a HowNow app that works within Slack and Microsoft Teams. Right now, with most of us working hybrid or in some cases remote, a lot of knowledge is transferred in chat tools like Slack and Microsoft Teams. Now, rather than losing all of that great knowledge in the stream of conversation, you can use the How Now Slack app to capture those answers, turn them into knowledge nuggets that live in How Now at one click of a button. 
Now, that's one way, but there are many, many other ways you can go about focusing on reducing the friction to capturing the knowledge. It might be as simple as using your mobile app to film yourself. It might be even not even be video content, encouraging your internal experts to do internal podcasts, right? Audio is one of the cheapest um, types of content for you to create internally within your organization. You can buy a decent microphone for under 50 pounds. You can use anything like Zoom to record the audio and upload it on free platforms that are easily accessible for employees. And it's a very flexible way of consuming content. So step one is capture. Step two is verify. Now, when people start capturing their knowledge and sharing their knowledge with each other, without um, moderating the content, you can very quickly end up in a situation where you've got a landfill site of out of date and inaccurate content. This is where you need a way of verifying that this content is up to date and relevant. Again, what our customers do is they use HowNow's built-in verification engine where you can essentially assign a verifier who tends to be your internal expert, and you can set a verification interval that says, say, six months time. And what that will do is in six months time, it will nudge your expert to verify whether this content is still up to date and relevant. If it isn't, they can update it or remove it. If it is, they verify it. Now, what that does is for the user who's looking at the content, they'll see a little notification that tells them this content you're looking at is verified and it was verified one week ago or one month ago. That creates trust and reliability. And in our experience, the higher the verified content, the more engagement you get because people trust the content you're looking at. And step three is compound. Now, compound learning, much like how compound savings work, is when you tap into your collective intelligence, we're now able to build on top of other people's learning, which accelerates the rate at which we learn. Now, this could be done by adding discussions to knowledge that's being shared internally by subject matter experts, where other people can add their knowledge nuggets. Other people can ask questions that people can build on top of. So by giving the tools for people to be able to engage and also add their thoughts on top, you're essentially accelerating the speed at which you learn and build on top of the collective intelligence you have. When you do this right, you essentially end up with a second brain for your collective company. Now, the second one is curate. Now, one of the biggest challenges we have right now is we're living in a post-content world where the challenge isn't content. Actually, content is abundant and cheap. The challenge is there's so much content out there. How do we find um, the most relevant content as quickly as possible? You know, if you've ever sat on Netflix um, and spent 30 minutes scrolling through all of the content to find, um, you know, and just to get frustrated by choice fatigue and just revert back to a, the same old show that you've watched before, that's exactly how employees feel when you dump 10,000 courses on them and say, go find the most relevant one. There's a really great statistic shared by McKinsey where they say on average, people spend 20% of their time trying to find the learning they need to do their job. That's one day a week. Now imagine how much more productive your people would be if they didn't spend that one day searching for what they needed, but they were easily connected with relevant content. Now, this is where curation plays a huge role. And curation is really the new creation, where it gives you a faster way to meet the needs of employees by rather than, rather than creating from scratch or a blank canvas, to use existing building blocks to build a solution that meets the employee's needs. And here are the three steps to curating effectively. Now, it'll be great to know in the chat if any of you have ever made a mixtape. Don't be shy. I've made one before too. So you can openly tell us if you've built, made a mixtape before. But I'm going to use that as a kind of example on how best to curate. Now, the first step is aggregate. Now, this is when imagine you're making a mixtape. The first thing you do is you bring together all of the songs that you and your high school sweetheart really like. Right? You aggregate all of the songs together. Much the same 
the first step of aggregating for curation of learning is aggregating the, all the different sources. Now, the source isn't your LMS, right? If I ask you when was the last time you learned something that had a big impact on your performance and career, it's highly likely that you wouldn't say LMS. You're likely to say you learned from your colleague or it was a blog or it's a podcast or it's a YouTube video or it's a book or it's a webinar. All of these things live in different places, are different types of content and different sources. Now, the first step is to bring all of this together. The second step is filter. Now, this is when, when you're making your mixtape, you look at all of the songs you've aggregated, then you pick out the songs that have a very special meaning for you and your high school sweetheart. Maybe it was a song that was playing on your first date. Maybe it was a song that was playing when you had your first dance at prom. You pick out those songs that have a very special meaning. The same thing goes for curation, where out of all of the content you've aggregated, now you filter out what is relevant for your organization or what is relevant for your need. Now, this process isn't just done by the L&D team, but the L&D team can set the guidelines to help employees do that filter. And there's different ways of filtering. You know, when employees like a piece of content, that's a form of filtering because for another employee looking at that content, they're more likely to select the content that has the likes because it seems like it's relevant to that particular audience. When employees share content with each other, you know, for example, if I read a blog and I shared it with my colleagues, that's a form of filtering from the rest of this content that's been aggregated. Now, step three is a critical step called enrich. Now, this is when, when you're making your mixtape, it's when you record those intros and outros before each song. You know, when you tell um, your, your high school sweetheart, this is why this song is so special to me, you record a little intro and add it before that song. Now, this is how you can enrich and contextualize your learning content. You could do it through highlights and annotations. You could do this by when you share a podcast or a blog, you can add commentary for why this is relevant for your particular industry or why this is relevant for your team or your company. Again, L&D can set the best practices for how employees, when they're sharing content or curating content, they can enrich it to contextualize it for the organization. Now, the last one I want to talk to you about is Amplify. Now, Often when um, L&D doesn't get engagement for the learning resources that they uh, push out to the organization, like I said, they often make the mistake of thinking it's always about the content. But sometimes it isn't a content problem at all. It's a marketing problem where for someone to engage with the content you're offering, they need to first know that the, A, the problem exists, you know, what's the problem that this learning resource is going to help me solve? You need to first make me realize that that problem exists. If I'm unaware of the problem, I'm unlikely to look for a solution. The second thing is once you've made me aware of the problem, you need to make me aware of the solution and convince me that this solution is a viable way of solving this problem. And this is where leveraging employees to market um, your learning offering is a really, really powerful way of closing that engagement gap. And there are three steps for doing this. The first one is social media. Now, if I asked you how many of you are in social media, I'm pretty certain all of you would say you are on at least one, if not two, different social media platforms. Now, if I asked you how many of you promote your internal learning and development on social media, Often when I ask that question, it's not many. And this is a huge missed opportunity because on average, we spend 144 minutes on social media. So it's a huge opportunity where you've got a captive audience. And so why wouldn't you, for example, um, create an Instagram feed for your company's L&D brand and you get all of the employees to follow you on Instagram? So next time they're scrolling through Instagram, they would also be able to see content that's being promoted by your L&D brand. Again, it goes back to the idea of rather than trying to drag employees to where we are, we should be sending learning and learning and development to where they are and where they are is social media. Now, if you're not too sure what social networks people in your company are using, then ask them. 
right? There's a good chance professionals are probably on LinkedIn. However, there might be others. It might be TikTok, right? Find them out. It might be Pinterest. Just by asking them, you can find out which social networks you need to be on to connect with your audience. Step two is influencer marketing, right? Leveraging the influencers within your organization. Now, there's a famous live streamer called Lipstick Brother in China who managed to sell $1.9 billion of goods in one day during a, a sales day that Alibaba runs called Singles Day. It's a shopping festival they run in one day. Now, just think about it. $1.9 billion worth of product by one influencer. It's impossible to scroll through any of your social network without coming across content from an influencer. Yet, we very rarely use influencer marketing internally, right? And every company has an influencer or influencers. Now, when you're trying to identify your influencers, what you want to think about is what's the kind of reach they have. Now, it doesn't have to be a huge audience, but they could have a highly engaged um, group of following within the organization. How relevant are they as an influencer to the content that you're trying to promote? And what experience and authority do they have? Now, an important thing to point out when you're trying to identify your influencers is they don't have to be senior people. Right? Often we make the uh, mistake that you have to be a head of or leadership, part of the leadership team to have influence. Actually, there are many people who don't have senior titles who have a lot of influence within organizations. They're typically the people who organize the socials. You know, they're at every social, or maybe they're the people who, when they post on LinkedIn, a lot of employees uh, tend to engage with that post. Or maybe, maybe even when they post internally on Slack or Teams, they get a lot of engagement. They're the ones you want to be able to identify. Then what you want to be able to do is empower those influencers by giving them the platform. You don't want to change the, their tone of voice because it still needs to remain authentic. But you can give them the platform, maybe give them a chance to write on your company blog, maybe give them a chance to share their story on the company LinkedIn page. But what you want to do is empower them. Another great way of leveraging influencers is to co-create content with them. One of our customers did this really, really well by creating a teaser video for their GDPR course using influencers within the company. Everyone, it's the fastest I've seen someone complete all of their GDPR um, training. It all happened within the space of a week, all because people came to see the course because they wanted to see the influencers from the organization feature in this teaser video. It was a great successful campaign. Now the last one for amplifying using employee driven marketing um, is social proof. Now, if I asked you, you were shopping for a desk and you can either buy one that has 300 reviews and a 4.7 or 40 reviews and two stars, which one are you likely to go for? I can put, put my house down that you go for the former with more reviews and a better rating. The same is true for the learning content that an employee is thinking about committing their time and energy to. So this is where you can build social proof and leverage employees to do that. Get employees to leave reviews for the content. You know, what were the key takeaways? Did it help them? Did it not help them? Think about it almost like a trip advisor for the learning that you're offering. This could be numerical too. Likes, comments, how many people viewed. Think of a way of how you can display these metrics. Another great way of doing it is building success stories and case studies. This is where if someone has gone engaged with your course or your learning resource and they've been successfully applied that learning and they've seen the impact of it, then capture that in an interview and share that story across the organization so everyone can see that actually someone engaged with this learning and they really found it valuable. Much like how when you're building a product, we share success stories to tell everyone else, look at this person who's been successful using our product. The same is true for what you can do within the organization. And this is really where you can tap into employees and get them in their own voice to share the success that they've experienced by engaging with your learning. So that's the three things you can go away today to tap into your employees and to be able to create, curate, and amplify. On that note, I'm gonna open up the floor for any Q&A. Yeah, thank you, Nelson. Uh, 
really great presentation. I really loved your your L and D bingo metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful one. <laughs> but it's it's really not close, not far away from the truth. So that's uh, that's also a bit horrible. <laughs> I like it a lot. So I don't see any questions popping up yet. So feel free. So I get a lot of positive responses that people uh, found it inspirational and- We do have one in the chat, Casper. Um, uh, would you consider the internet to amplify internal or like internal influencers? Yeah, absolutely. Internet is just another platform you can leverage, right? So if you found an influencer um, by getting them to be able to share their success story or their content, um, on the internet, you're giving them the platform to amplify that voice. So yeah, definitely internet is, is another platform to leverage. Yeah, nice. I, people are just saying that so much and really well done. So uh, sometimes no questions is a very good sign that you covered a lot. So um, yeah, I think. Yeah, so I think then we'll just leave it with this. Uh, so thank you a lot nelson and i can oh, wait we just got one in <laughs> sorry oh, wait a minute. yeah <laughs> yeah um okay do you see this one casper from uh michael i i can answer it but um michael as i gather this should uh then be more uh, a more structured relationship between the marketing department and um l and d yeah definitely i think that's a great starting point and, and again, it goes back to kind of tapping into internal expertise. We, we often go look externally to go learn about marketing and how best to do marketing. But chances are you've got experts in your marketing team who are doing it day in, day out for your business. Um, and there's a reason why they're there, because they know what they're doing. Um, and so it's, you know, again, working with them, uh, tapping into their expertise um, and, and leveraging the tactics. You know, a lot of what I've just spoken about there. Um, you know, often there's one of the stories I talk about is, uh, I think it's back in 2020, five, uh, 2010, five guys got together and decided to start a mattress company. Um, you know, a few years later, they became a billion dollar company. Now, no one would think a mattress company is an exciting one, but they managed to reinvent the entire category with better marketing, right? It was a tone of voice, it's a company called Casper. It was friendly, it was approachable, it was fun, it was informative. And what that tells you that's one of the examples. But if you look at direct to consumer businesses, they've used marketing to make a whole range of mundane products exciting, everything from toothbrushes to mattresses. So what that tells you is there's no such thing as a boring product. There's only boring marketing. And learning is far from being a boring product. We're talking about the thing that can really change the way you perform and achieve your outcomes so if you can do it for a mattress you can sure as hell do it for learning and so it's a case of tapping into people who are doing that and i think your marketing team is a great place to start but i think in the long run it's a skill that also um l d teams should look to develop right uh, because it's a key part at the end of the day you you want people to engage with your content so it's a key skill to build so, but nelson to give a, a bit of pushback on that so is it a problem then that we are, as an l and pushing content to the learners that they don't want? And if you just let them make the choice and if they have the learning needs uh, then presented to them, then the whole problem will be gone instantly? Yeah, great question, Casper. So the debate on push and pull learning, I think pull learning or self-directed learning is great for the known unknowns, right? So I can search for something when I know I don't know it. Right. And, right. and that tends to be great for upskilling. I know I'm at a level two in Python. I want to get to level three. So that's a known unknown that I can search for. But where push learning is powerful is the unknown unknowns is I don't know. Right. I, I don't know what I need to learn because there's so many other variables. There's market variables. Um, there's the company might be pivoting to a new direction, which I'm not aware of. And this is where L&D in the business plays a critical role in making sure that push learning helps me, points me in the direction of the unknown unknowns. And so this is where I make the comparison between outbound and inbound marketing, right? Inbound marketing is where I go find it myself. It's similar to pool learning. Outbound marketing, we still do it. Every company today still does. Out, even the guys who founded inbound marketing at HubSpot do outbound marketing. But what they do is they do it better by using data to segment that target audience. And I'll give you a quick example. Imagine we were all running a high protein cereal bar 
company. Now we can either market that cereal bar company to everyone who has breakfast, or we can market it to everyone who goes to the gym just before work in the morning and therefore has no time to have breakfast and they need a high protein cereal bar. Now, if you ask me which audience is likely to engage more, it's probably the latter because it's a much more targeted audience. So push learning in a one size fits all sense, you're right, doesn't work. But push learning with better data informed to target your segment audience is I think absolutely essential uh, for companies to, to be able to learn at speed. But then it becomes really uh, important because if you are talking about learning the known unknown, so uh, I, I agree with you. So if, if you don't know what you need to learn, so it's great if somebody informs you on that, but there's a huge difference between a mandatory training that I have to take, although I don't want it, or a learning department informing me of an opportunity I have for learning. For, for sure. And, and I think everything I've said here is, is not about mandatory training, right? See, mandatory training is the low-hanging fruit that you've got. By mandating it, whether they like it or not, you're getting them to do it. The only thing I'd make you wary of is really think about which things you're mandating and whether it's necessary to mandate it or not, right? Correct. But we're talking about now where you have a choice, right? So when I'm saying push learning, I'm not mandating it. What I'm doing is I'm making you aware that there's this unknown, unknown problem, educating you about the problem, then educating, informing you of the solution. Fundamentally, the decision on whether you engage or not is down to you. Correct. So, and that way you stay out of the, the L&D bingo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got it. <laughs> okay. I think we have a couple of new messages uh, here. Um, Maybe the one from uh, Marianne at the top. Okay. Um, Marianne. Okay. If you can't afford an XP yet, uh, do you have any tips for curating courses and content for specific audiences? Yeah, for sure. So like, you, this is not a technology is going to solve all of your problems. And this is probably not the thing you want to hear from the founder of a technology company. But the reality is tech will make your life easier and it will make it more efficient, more effective. But you can start solving the problem without tech. So all of the three steps I said around aggregate, filter, enrich, you can manually do it. And the chances are you're probably somewhat doing it, right? You're, you're as an L&D team, we work with many L&D teams where they're curating great articles, great books, and then they kind of filter that out into relevant teams. They tend to send a email newsletter, right? Going, oh, you might find this relevant. But so the first step might be rather than just L&D doing it, set the guidelines for everyone across the business to do it. Right. Tell them what's a good way of curating, how to decide whether content is high quality or not, what to do when you find something relevant, where should they sh share it? Maybe you've got Slack or Microsoft Teams, set up a channel, get them to share it there, do it for each one of the teams. And then adding the commentary and context, you can do that from messages to docs. So you can hack together with what you've got now to start curating and curating across the business. But what you'll have is at some point you'll hit a bottleneck right? Or it's taking too much time or the experience is clunky. Um, and to solve all of those inefficiencies, that's when you need the technology. Yeah, correct. So an example what I did with uh, uh, curation is that uh, I used to go a lot to eager the conference pre-COVID. So I was a real, real good at that. So, and I also had my personal blog. So what I did a lot, if I look at a program of a, of a learning technology conference, probably have like 100, 200 speakers. So what I would do, so basically you are three steps. So I would sort of uh, aggregate it. So see what is there, then filter it out. So these, this is my selection. And then post a blog where I explain, I will go to this session because I love this topic or I love the speaker and other people could benefit from it. And I just wrote it down in a blog. So you could do that in words so that there, there's just, uh, nothing necessary there. So it's, uh, it's really simple. But indeed, if you have like a thousand pieces of curated content, then you get a chance how to find it and how to 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 keep yeah. it. Yeah. See, I, I think emails is done right. Just an email digest of curated resources is powerful. Again, and it must caveat done right, where you're not pushing out one email to the entire organization. And I'd recommend again, giving you another startup example, um, to read up about the the origin story of a company called Product Hunt. The entire business was as simple as an email that curates the latest products that have been released in tech. That was it. They built a multi-million pound business on the back of that email. 
right? Um, until today, the highest engagement rate they get is from that email, right? That is their core product. And that gives you a good example of when it's done right, something like just your email is a great way of curating and getting that engagement. So we have a question from Al as well, um, going into the fact that you said that uh, L&D teams should uh, collaborate with marketing. So uh, do you have thoughts on how we can persuade the teams outside L&D of the value of cross-specialism working? Yeah, um, see, the, the convincing is, again, let's go back to the beginning. It's not just marketing. I think L&D sh should be, that's what's so exciting about L&D as a function and as a role, is you have the opportunity to collaborate across the business, right? And, and that's what we should be doing because essentially we exist to solve business problems. Right. Um, it's in a way, if you think about L&D in terms of the product or service we're offering, people are hiring the product or service we're offering to solve the problem they have across the business. So really, we should be collaborating. We should be collaborating to and, and a great way to get them to collaborate is to tell them the age old what's in it for them. Right. Fundamentally, you exist to find out what's their problem, not to go get the course that they've asked you to go get. That's an important differentiation. So if you're working with the sales team, what you're trying to find out is what is the sales team's problem that's holding them back from hitting their target or hitting their OKRs? That's how you're collaborating, to really do that problem discovery, to define the problem, then to work with them, to start testing on what solution can help you solve that problem and to define the metric that tells you when that problem is being solved. So say, for example, if they're saying we're not hitting our sales target, Great, let's dig into this problem. And what you realize is the sales conversion rate is 20%, but actually you need it to be higher. So you come up with an outcome where your baseline right now is 20%, you want it to move to 30%. Great, now you start working on a solution. Maybe it's product knowledge. Okay, let's start fixing product knowledge and see whether that improves our sales conversion rate. Are we starting to see movement from 20% to 30%? No, it's not working, great. Maybe it's objection handling, you test, and you see if it's working. Once it starts moving there, they're invested. Right? It's in their best interest because by solving that problem for them, you're making them look good. Often what happens is when we reach out to the wider business to collaborate, we ask them to collaborate for our sake. Right? But people need to know what's in it for them, not what's in it for you. Yeah, correct. So I'm just checking, but um, oh, question popping up from Karen, uh, Kristen. Sorry, what are your ideas for incentivizing influencers and SME to create learnings? How to capture their precious time when they have other priorities? Yeah, so here's where I'll ask you. Right? You see, you're probably following or connected with a bunch of people on LinkedIn. And um, let's just say LinkedIn. What incentive do people have to go post on LinkedIn, these long posts, or on Twitter, these long threads? What's the incentive? They're not getting paid. Right. Unless you're an actual influencer who's getting paid for brand endorsements, there's a whole bunch of other subject matter experts who are willingly taking time out to craft and put out great content to be recognized as experts. That is, that's what's driving us, is the recognition and acknowledgement that we're experts. Now, imagine that for someone within the organization. If you're telling them, I'm going to give you the exposure to be recognized for your talent, your skills. And often, again, we don't do a good job in L&D of telling you what's in it for you. What's in it for you isn't about cash or bonuses or other incentives. It is the fact that we recognize you as an expert within the organization and as an influencer. And we want to give you the platform so all of the business know how great you are at what you do. And how great do you think they'll feel when you amplify their post on the company blog or in the intranet? And they get likes, they get messages, you know, from people going, I really love that interview you did or that podcast that you did instantly. I love that content. That um, social recognition is what the incentive is. The long as you can help them get that, that's what's in it for them, right? Um, and the chances are they're probably doing it in some shape or form in a small way, right? You've always got influences in the organization where a colleague posts a question on Slack or Teams and there is another colleague who's always the one who goes to answer that question. Why are they doing it? They're doing it to help and to be recognized as an expert. And that's what we need to make help them amplify. Yeah. 
And there's an, another bonus in them. So if once you recognize as an expert, so also what sometimes happens, people start creating content and both of them are recognized as experts on the same field. They can actually find each other and start collaborating and learn from each other. So that's something that, that follows on with that. But that's indeed what mostly in, in, in for people indeed get that recognition and be able to help people, but also yeah, get that recognition by themselves. And we've got a response uh, from Al on your answer on the, the, the collaborating with the marketing. So his challenge is that uh, the marketing seems to say you can't do that when you are attempting to scale your employee-driven marketing, uh, for example. So you just get a no from them. So how do you convince them? My chat, your marketing, I, I would dig into that. Um, I, maybe you have got an answer there, but in terms of why you can't do employee-driven, I mean, for example, LinkedIn, most companies are on LinkedIn as a company uh, channel to build their employer brand, right? L&D is a fundamental pillar of your um, employer brand. So the question I'd ask is, I'm, I'm sure you're probably in your organization using your employees to promote your employer brand. You know, when you're talking about who's in the team, look how great their career progression has been over the last four years. Um, that is you doing marketing from an employer brand perspective. All you're doing is using the same channels, but to drive not only the great thing about promoting L&D on these channels is people who are not part of your organization yet get to see that you're prioritizing and putting L&D first. But then the people who are part of your organization are going to see this content where they need to see it. And, and so I think, again, it's trying to dig into with your marketing team, why not? Why can't we do this? What's the blocker here? And, and convincing them in the same way you would to put together a business case to get a budget. Sometimes you need to take them on a journey with you, right? And start small. I, I often, one of my favorite lines is to say, think big, start small. And, and a good way to do it is start small. They go, okay, can we just try it for one month? Just for this campaign. Can we start putting out posts and see whether we get more engagement as a way of doing that? If it doesn't work, fine, we'll scrap it. But what's the harm, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's what I'd start with. Okay, thank you.